We're good, Tanya. Okay, Council, we're good to go. Thank you very much. Good morning. This special council meeting for the Township of Selwyn for the draft 2023 budget for Thursday, January the 26th, 2023. Uh, welcome to everyone. We respectfully acknowledge that we are on the treaty and traditional territory of the Mishi, Sagig, and Anishinaabe. We offer our gratitude to the First Peoples for their care for and teachings about our earth and our relations. May we honor those teachings. Please observe a moment of silence so that council, staff, and members of the public can quietly reflect on our duty to the community that we are trying to serve. Thank you. Members of the public, staff, presenters, and members of council, please be advised that meetings are broadcast and recorded and made available on the internet. Is there any declaration of pecuniary interest and the general nature thereof of anything that we are talking about today? Seeing none, please note that in the minutes. We have no deputations. Is there any question from question period? Uh, no, no questions. Thank you very much. All right, so we will go directly to our manager financial services, Lane Vance, and I will ask my colleagues if you have any questions, as uh, you can ask them as we go along in the presentation. Please put up your electronic hand uh, so that um, I know that you've got the questions ready. Thank you, and it's over to you, Lane. Great, thank you very much. Um, nice to see everybody today and thanks for taking the time to hold this uh, special meeting. Consider the next steps in our uh, taxation and area rates budget. We're here we are on, uh, on Zoom again. This is the third year that I've presented uh, the municipal budget on Zoom. Um, it's a little different for sure. Um, and so I'll, uh, I'll begin sharing my screen here shortly and we'll work through that uh, PowerPoint presentation that was circulated. Uh, presentation is definitely in the same order as the budget binder, which was distributed earlier, uh, late last week, actually. Um, so as we work through the presentation, I'll be adding some additional comments uh, as we go, definitely pausing for questions. And uh, if I can't uh, kind of answer the questions on first blush, then we definitely have our management team, which can, uh, can chime in with uh, the, uh, the detailed responses. So... I'll just see if I can get my screen up here sharing okay. And I think everybody should be able to see my screen at this point in time. So hoping uh, once again that this can be as, as interactive as, uh, as prior years and Format seems to have worked well, but definitely any questions as we go, that's great. So just a reminder of our budget cycle and, uh, and where we are. So we're definitely January 26th, presentation of the consolidated budget. Uh, it's just a process that began many months ago. Uh, and as outlined uh, in, on the slide, our, our 2022 year end is still uh, in an internal preliminary state. So we're working with the uh, department managers trying to get those last minute invoices in and accruing those back to 2022. Uh, I would say that the actuals that are presented in the budget are, are a fairly good level, but we still always have late stragglers that come in with invoices. And uh, to ensure that things go well with my audit, I make sure that they get accrued back and, and properly recorded. Uh, a reminder as well that we are building on the presentation that I provided to council in December. And, all the department managers were there at that to talk, discuss our capital investments uh, that we're moving ahead with in 2023. So um, I won't spend a lot of time on those, but I definitely will talk uh, to some changes in that section when we get to it. Um, and also the impacts that we reviewed at that uh, session as well, just a reminder for council to think back to some of those inflationary pressures that we're, we're dealing with as well. 
So uh, just to set the context for today's discussion, we'll, we look at 2023, one of the key factors always is uh, assessment and new growth in assessment. So a reminder that uh, our CBA values are actually frozen at the 2016 values. Uh, they were phased in over four years. Uh, so given the pandemic, the Ontario government has postponed uh, any update to those 2020 uh, values. So the property values that we're seeing other than uh, if there was an improvement to property or some type of a, a decrease due to a request for reconsideration, they're the same values that were in place in, in uh, 2021. So that means 2022 and 2023, same tax year uh, for assessment. And uh, so we're only looking at uh, specific properties at around 314,000 when we actually look at comparable properties. With respect to our net growth, so, so that is, uh, it, it does take into account any reassessment uh, due to reductions and things like that, but more importantly, the, uh, the renos, the new builds, those types of things. We had a good year last year in Zellin. Uh, true growth is a little over 1%. And uh, as outlined in the binder, um, the residential class makes up a significant portion of our assessment rule. So it's no surprise that the residential class was almost 1% uh, on its own. Uh, so that 1% translates into, into dollars, uh, a little over $118,000 of value. So we're able to use that $118,000 of new assessment growth and new tax dollars to offset some of those inflationary pressures that I outlined earlier. So while assessment yields uh, taxes, the township's very fortunate also to receive a variety of provincial and federal grants and, and also some uh, funding from other agencies like the Trillium Foundation um, and, and other local um, um, granting authorities. And the narrative definitely outlines a the span of provincial grants that we have received. Uh, we've enjoyed really solid support uh, from the province over the last few years and heading into 2023. And um, I can say that uh, throughout the pandemic and the challenges of COVID, uh, the province did come to the table with a safe restart funding. And we ended up coming out of uh, uh, COVID without any significant uh, operational deficits. We did uh, need to draw down our operating funds but we were fortunate to receive uh, some very good grants from the province and wanted to pass along my thanks to them um, publicly uh, or for that. Uh, a slide here just about a couple of stable uh, funding sources from the province. The Ontario Municipal Partnership Fund, uh, that's our, our true unconditional grant that we receive from the province. No, no real strings attached to that. Um, we have used it um, uh, mostly in the last few years, we did at the very, very start also a little bit of tax increase, but we realized that we didn't uh, actually want to be at the, uh, the whim of, of the province to cut some of their funding. So we only used um, uh, this point for uh, deficit clearing from the prior year, for capital investments, or for maybe a, a one-time investment in something so that we know it's going to happen this year and and then uh, we're not gonna have to deal with it again. So we use those grants so that we don't need to worry about uh, tapping into reserves or worrying about increasing taxes. So that went up uh, a little over $50,000 over last year's level. So that was, that was welcome. Uh, there's quite a calculation as to how they come up with that in terms of uh, assessment growth in the area, what the uh, personal income is for the average household in our area, uh, information from StatsCan, uh, information based on our community makeup and whether we have urban centers and small communities or whether it's a rural or remote uh, community. Keep in mind that this is used all across the, the province. Uh, the other grant, the Ontario Community Investment Fund, uh, it's a newer grant that's only come out in the last number of years. It's primarily brought in to support asset management and investments in those assets. Um, we, we have used it in the, in the past, uh, primarily for asset management and the planning of that, but in the last few years, we have started to use it for uh, asset reinvestment. 
and uh, we're, we're using that this way this year as well. We did actually experience a decrease in that over the 2022 levels. And I have uh, reviewed that with some councillors. So I did a review of all of the OSEF grants in uh, a county and every county uh, municipality, as well as the county actually experienced a decrease this year uh, of the maximum amount, 15%. Uh, whereas uh, the more urban centers actually experience growth in their OC grant, which relates back to uh, current value uh, replacement costs for assets. So definitely underlining the, the need for a solid asset management plan, really good values uh, and the need to maybe invest in uh, a little bit more consulting in some of those areas to ensure that our replacement values are, are really accurate moving forward. And of course, uh, this is just one slide reviewing uh, two of our stable sources of funding, but there's many more unconditional, or sorry, many more conditional and application-based funding programs that we've uh, been fortunate to receive. Um, great work on behalf of Angie and, and uh, Megan and her staff there in terms of getting those applications in and got a really good track record there in terms of getting those conditional grants approved on some solid applications. Uh, over to the federal grant, the uh, Canada Community Building Fund, um, uh, $564,000 this year. So that is an increase of uh, a little over $23,000. That's uh, a fund that's administered uh, through AMEL here in Ontario, uh, but it is a grant that goes across Canada. Uh, so in years where uh, Ontario doesn't have as, as big a growth as other provinces, our, our number may actually fall, despite the fact that our, our municipality may be thriving and, and the province as a whole may be thriving, but they look across Canada and uh, uh, I know one year BC actually had higher growth than Ontario and so we actually had a bit of a clawback that year. Um, we do know that this number at 564 should be good for this year and also good for next year as well and then they'll go through a rejig again based on StatsCan data that comes out. So we've looked at some revenue sources, um, just to uh, touch on the capital budget and uh, as we work through and uh, along the budget, um, as I mentioned, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this because we did uh, spend an entire uh, meeting uh, talking about it, but I did want to update uh, council. There is a new summary sheet in the, in the budget. So that's the big 11 by 17 sheet. So we did update some of those um, specific uh, capital programs that are carrying over from year to year. And uh, I just want to touch on some of those now. As I mentioned in 2022, still the year end is still very much underway. So there could be some minor tweaks, but at this point we have most of our final invoices on the larger program. We've made our hold back. So that's that 10% amount that we don't have to pay out on capital contracts until the very end of the project. Um, so those types of expenses have already been recorded. Um, the summary, uh, what I like about that is that at a glance and throughout the year, council should be able to look at that one pager and take a look at the investments we're making in the community and, uh, and how we're funding that. And uh, in some instances, the funding does change uh, a little bit based on the quantity uh, involved with the uh, grant. But uh, I can say that at 5.2 million, this is a significant investment year. Um, you know, somewhere in around three, three and a half is, norm, is typical. Um, two major projects underway this year, uh, the Water Street project, and that's a multi-year project. And uh, in our facilities area, um, at the old police station, old post office, chamber of commerce building, whatever uh, counselors would want to refer to it as, it's the, right at the corner there. Um, that's a significant investment this year uh, as well. So a few, a few shots just of that. that uh, project is, is well underway at this point. As you can see, we went through the demo stage. Um, and as noted in the binder at the bottom of, of page one, um, and as council can appreciate when we get into renos of, of old buildings, and, and for that matter, uh, whenever you're dealing with underground construction as well, you're always in for a few surprises for sure. So as outlined in, in the budget binder, um, discovered that really the HVAC system can't really produce su sufficient cooling for the second floor. Uh, we 
it was kind of suspected before, but they did some additional detailed review of it. And at this point, they're suggesting that for the project to be successful, we need to have dedicated um, cooling for the second floor. Um, so uh, Megan, Mike, Angie, and the crew have been dealing with our architects there on that. And uh, they haven't uh, determined the exact solution yet. We're trying to find the most energy efficient solution to come up with, but uh, we're in the neighborhood of a quarter million dollars for eight HVAC additions uh, on that project, and uh, they're working through the, the final details on that at this point in time. So uh, we've included that additional amount. The funding for that would come from our facility and property reserve. That's typically where we would fund any type of HVAC upgrades or replacements uh, as we go through a building project. And uh, we'll continue to report out on that project as we get various stages. And I'm sure that Mike and Megan will want to get counsel through at some point in time when it's safe to do so. Uh, the, the other project that I had mentioned is Water Street, uh, and we're on to phase two. And I just I just noted phase two as amended. Uh, we were able to move forward with uh, uh, some additional work in 2022, and that, that came forward uh, in the form of a budget amendment to Council of the Day. Uh, we were able to do some additional stormwater works uh, in terms of storm scepters uh, that actually catch uh, the, some of the oil and grit coming off the road. So it's a good environmental addition. Uh, we were able to get some of those uh, in the fall and also complete the boat launch, uh, which now allows the boat launch to uh, to be used uh, in the spring, really. Um, we were concerned about water levels and different things like that. And so the contractor was well ahead of schedule and we moved forward on that. So phase two has been amended. Um, now moving forward with the completion from reed to bridge. Uh, and just a reminder to, to council, there's a lot of moving parts definitely on this project as well, um, and many funding sources. So we, we have the support of the, uh, the federal government through their uh, community capacity building fund. We have roads grants involved um, from OSEF. We have reserve transfers from roads and any of the underground work uh, attributable to stormwater um, comes from, from OSEF. Anything from water comes from the water reserve. Anything for sewer comes from the sewer reserve. So anything specifically to do with utilities that uh, aren't tax supported come from our sewers of those other areas of water and sewer. So there's no cross subsidization involved in that. So the great part about that is when we do a complete build on a road like this, we, have, we do have many funding sources, but ideally we won't be go going back uh, in a few years to, to take a look at something because it's all new infrastructure that's on the ground. Uh, so just a brief uh, pie chart here just to show where the investments are being made. Obviously, the majority of investments uh, here are in roads and roads equipment. We also have good investments in facilities and then in technology as well. And so facilities and technologies are included there in the blue on the right hand side of the screen. That's a bit of a snapshot uh, as well. And it, it's one of those uh, slides that if council wants to keep handy during the year and gets inquiries from uh, repairs and things like that, then that's the type of investments that council is making in the community this year. Also in that section, just a reminder about some of the uh, studies and the forward looking approaches that we're taking in some areas uh, with respect to cyber insurance and uh, the concerns about cyber security uh, really across the board, we are, Moving forward with an incident response assessment uh, that was reviewed at the capital meeting in, in December. Asset management is ongoing. We have uh, updates to provide the council this year. Uh, our next major re rewrite of some sections is in 2024 when we'll be dealing with uh, facilities. And so we will likely uh, um, continue to use some of our funding that we have in place. And we will probably seek out a Federation of Canadian Mission municipalities grant to support us on our facilities uh, review. The community risk assessment, that's in the fire department. Uh, that's the first report of its kind for us. And, and Gordon uh, and Janice are working with the consultant there to get that in place. Our development charges study is up for renewal. Um, I've had discussions with the, our, our consultant on that. And the suggestion there is that there would be some component of 
the study uh, completion where uh, the consultant would spend some time with council at a meeting and review the changes of Bill 23, the impact of Bill 23 on development charges overall, and uh, confirm how it will affect our, our township. So there'll be a little bit more time spent this year on that type of information sharing uh, with council, just so that we're all up, on, uh, up to speed and on the same page. And the last uh, area in studies is the fundraising strategy, which is just nearing completion. Uh, we have a local consultant that's working on that. That's to support our fundraising strategy here locally to take a look at uh, sponsorships and maybe some other areas of revenues that we can bring in, but also to support the community as well. So there is a uh, there has been a community outreach portion of that, looking at not for profits and different community groups and seeing if they can be supported that way. And we've got a bit of a community meeting coming up through Zoom here in the next little while on that as well. So we're, we're uh, moving through the sections of the binder fairly good here. We're at uh, reserves at this point in time. Uh, so if, if assessment has basically yields us taxes, we had an overview of grants and the capital investments. Reserves are, are, are the key source of funding for capital. And it's really an area that we set aside funds for future years through operational transfers. A bit of a, a snapshot of just where are we with respect to our reserves at this point in time. Um, and I think council can probably note it there, but just in terms of the colors, the yellow is working funds. So that's basically accumulated revenue that we carry forward from year to year. If there are savings in a department, uh, that department uh, uh, keeps those funds and rolls them through into the next year. And that's what we start the, the budget process with. We have specific reserves, that's the kind of lime green section. And then we have deferred revenues and reserve funds at the top in the blue. Um, it's uh, estimated in this year's budget that at the very end, uh, any of the tax supported reserves, we will get about $13 million by year's end. The specific reserves are definitely the largest component there. They include reserves, uh, for instance, to support replacement of fire equipment, uh, roads equipment, roads construction, uh, the facilities that I noted before in terms of you know, roofs or uh, HVAC systems or major upgrades, things like that. But there's also other specific reserves that we set aside uh, to ensure that if uh, something comes along every so often, we don't have to immediately turn to council and say, it looks like we're gonna have to increase taxes to take care of this. And so some of those reserves would be the insurance contingency reserve, a winter control contingency, an election uh, reserve. So we set aside money every year so that when we have that election every fourth year, then uh, we don't need to all of a sudden kind of have a big panic. We just have that money coming out of reserve and it pays for it. Uh, and that'll be there again in 2026. I think I see a, a hand up there. Sorry, um, Councillor Boyko. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Lane. Um, and through you, uh, Madam Mayor, the, uh, I, I want to first thank all of all of staff who has worked uh, incredibly hard putting this together. I know the process is uh, arduous and takes takes a lot of time and a lot of effort and a lot of sacrifice because everybody doesn't get what they want. And thank you, Lane, especially for leading this. The, the question I have is with respect to reserves, um, we note on that graph that shows it um, well, that our reserves are shrinking three years in a row. And I know, Lane, um, you have mentioned before that you would like always to have more reserves um, because rainy days do come. These grants can suddenly disappear or shrink. Are you concerned about the fact that we have a three-year um, trend here with shrinking reserves? I don't know, to, to you, uh, Madam Mayor, um, the the lime green section doesn't concern me nearly as much as that small yellow one at the bottom. Yeah. Um, the, the lime green section, definitely, we're pulling out uh, uh, over a million dollars for uh, roads equipment this year, but that's really why we built that reserve up, was to replace that. Um, the purchases there of council, we recall, are like a large uh, excavator, um, number of tandems, uh, the sweeper, things like that, right? So those are large ticket items that we do have to set aside reserves over the years uh, so that we 
uh, can pull reserves out and fund those. So that's not as as concerning. And we also are pulling quite a bit out of facilities this year, but once again, we'll we'll build that back up. The the concern a little bit more is working funds, yeah. and uh, it doesn't seem like you know a big drop, but uh, once those working funds are gone, then um, we don't really have a good mechanism in place to replace those. Um, so if there is a, a surplus in one year, what we try to look at the very next year is to say, okay, is there a one-time expense that we know we can use a little bit of that reserve, uh, have that one-time expense, and then the next year it's not going to be there, so it's not so much of an issue. Uh, we've been fairly successful doing that, but I will say in the last couple of years, we've to, to get to a number uh, overall for tax uh, for the tax levy, we maybe had to hit that a little bit harder than I would have liked to in terms of my approach. So if anything, that would be the area that I'm a little bit more uh, concerned about. Uh, not not so concerned that I, I guess I would say I wouldn't bring the budget forward to council at this point if I was super concerned about it. I just, it's a, an area of caution and something that uh, I, I will just raise for, uh, for council. It's uh, something we have to have regard for moving forward and when I uh, provide the impact section and we talk about a drop or a decrease in accumulated revenue or the fact that it isn't there this year because we used it last year, that's what I'm talking about, really. It's that small yellow section at the bottom. Okay, thank you. So, uh, so really, yeah, just to move on to the reserves do allow us to just kind of plan ahead and, and take those peaks and valleys out of the tax levy. So this is a good year to take a look at that and say, we are using it uh, for its purpose. We're using those roads to offset capital. We're using the roads equipment reserve to offset the purchases. And definitely if, if we're in good shape in terms of reserve and if, if they're um, sufficient, then they provide a solid and stable source of funding. And we are going to draw reserves down quite a bit this year if all of our capital purchases come come along and if equipment does get delivered. Um, we, we are definitely experiencing supply chain issues with, with some of the vehicles, the trucks in particular. Um, I will say as well, and, and maybe uh, through you, uh, Madam Mayor, to Councillor Boyko, we will, we will be taking a deeper dive into reserves in 2023 in some of those discussions because uh, I'd alluded to, I think, at an earlier meeting with respect to policy. And one of the things uh, that's on my radar this year is to take our um, fairly established practice and how we do things with our reserves and actually get it down in writing and turn it into a policy that can be discussed at the council table. So um, I think that that, first of all, it will it'll help us a little bit when we get more into asset management uh, planning, but it will also some satisfy uh, some other agencies to provide funding to us as well. Okay, just, just to move along now to in, impacts. And uh, this is really the tab that takes all of the various influences, uh, impacts that we've experienced throughout the budget and tries to condense it down into a few pages. And so it is a challenge to put this forward because, uh, uh, you know, when we may have a dollar value in there that's maybe $5,000, um, yeah, there's, there's probably other areas of the budget where we may have had an impact of $5,000 and it's not mentioned. But what we try to do is mention it on, on a department if it has a very specific impact in that department. Um, and so that's why it's, it's, it's on the sheet. It has uh, provided good discussion points over the years uh, for council, but also once again, uh, a good area for, for speaking points if they're talking to ratepayers uh, in the community. Um, we definitely are experiencing some pretty heavy inflationary pressures this year. and. Uh, when everybody says, well, um, you know, our, our ratepayers are, are really feeling it. Uh, I know I, as a ratepayer, I'm feeling it as well. I think most counselors are feeling it when we go get groceries or fill up at the, at the gas pumps. But you can imagine a municipality with the um, gross expenditures of in excess of $20 million. I can say that the township's feeling it as well. So um, this type of impact analysis, um, if council has any questions, please feel free to ask. So a bit of a pie chart on our gross expenditures, so just to kind of solidify where our expenditures are coming from, public works, general government, recreation, 
fire jerry's protection of course with uh, that includes policing because it's like gross expenditure area so our policing and that would include both of our, our police areas as well as uh, building and planning uh, as well you see a high priority on infrastructure uh, in the roads the public works area roads and storm sewer and uh, of course uh, general government uh, that captures all of our legislative requirements administrative and any of the financial work that we do at the municipality as well Now, looking at it, uh, kind of the chart in a little bit different way, this is just our net funding. So, uh, net funding as it relates to uh, net taxation. And so, the blue is is really our funding areas from last year and where we funded it from our tax levy. Um, I will say that in some years, um, council wouldn't see any yellow areas in some area in some uh, bars here. Like, for instance, some years the waste may not have any yellow area because we're able to take care of uh, the expenditures there. Sometimes it's in rec and culture because of user fees that are coming in. Uh, but yeah, this is one of these years where we're feeling it uh, across the board really. Um, it's, it shows high priority areas in each of the, in each of the bars that are uh, indicated there. And as we reviewed in December, we're feeling it really in many areas, human resources, insurance, as I mentioned, supply chain uh, delays, but inflationary pressures across the board. Um, fleet purchases uh, in a big way, but that's capital, uh, but also in fuel and uh, utilities as well. Oh, excuse me, Lane. We do have a question from uh, Deputy Mayor Black. Thanks uh, through you, Mayor Sennis. Uh, this is a great graph and a great depiction of kind of where uh, cost changes have happened or, or or income reductions have happened in the province. And I think looking at the waste management one, clearly uh, the the yellow bar it, as a percentage of the total bar is significantly higher than most of the other areas. And I think that's, uh, as we chatted uh, in the past, but around reducing, uh, there is a reduced uh, expectation around tipping fees and also a fair increase in, in costs to run our waste management site. So it seems unusual that it's there's that big of a, a delta year over year uh, in, in waste. Can you uh, explain why there's such a big change? Uh, sure, I, I, I can speak to that now. We definitely will be going through summary uh, by department and I'll, I'll definitely chat about that a little bit more there. But yeah, overall, I would just say for waste that uh, we're seeing our, our tipping weights decrease uh, at the site. Um, and this is coming after uh, um, investments in customer service at the site where we've ensured that our scales are in great shape. Um, Randy and his, his crew over there take really good care of the site. We added uh, internet so that we could have high speed for uh, uh, transactions at the scale so people weren't delayed at the scales with respect to debits. And we now accept credit cards, so there's, there's a cost to that as well. Um, so one of the areas at the actual site uh, is it is contributing to the cost increase. The other big area with respect to waste though is the waste collection contract. So it's the curbside collection. While all of the actual um, waste or garbage from curbside goes to Bensford, we actually pay for the uh, contractor uh, to, to pick it up. In uh, the fall of 2022, we were able to uh, extend the existing contract without having to go to full tender. Uh, there was an increase in the contract, so we're feeling that uh, right off the bat in 2023. There was also um, a fuel surcharge that was included as well, uh, given the, the price of fuel. So fuel is, uh, the surcharge is anywhere from about $3,500 to $4,000 plus a month for the fuel surcharge. And then uh, the budget is laid out on uh, the extension of the contract for the second year in September, and that is built in as well. So we're seeing the impacts of two collection contract uh, increases as well as fuel surcharges. Uh, so a combination of uh, the site and the curbside collection is why there's an increase there. Thanks, Lane. Okay, so to, to move uh, 
on in the impact tab away from some, some graphs and to get to some real uh, real numbers. This is just a bit of a summary. It shows um, across the various departments. I've had to consolidate uh, in a couple of areas in transportation services and parks and rec included the arenas there just to kind of get it all fitted on, on one graph. Uh, but this is essentially the, the net tax levy in, on one slide. Um, well, we look at the net effect across all of our departments and we take away the uh, true assessment growth. We're looking at a net tax levy of our municipal departments of almost $400,000. And that's uh, on the net tax levy 4.86% over last year. So in the actual uh, budget binder, we, we, we start the analysis at a really high level. And then as we drill down into the other departments, user fees have an impact. Um, maybe there's some other room that we had, uh, knowing that there isn't gonna be that one-time expenditure that I talked about before. But at the very end of the day, that's this is what it comes down to in that one slide. Uh, we have had questions in the in the past from council on just you know what did we have to cut or what was the rationale? How did we get to four point eight six percent? So um, in, it is a little bit of a challenge because as we get into the budget process, if we find a an expenditure area, we think, oh, there's there's some savings, those types of things. When you're right into it, you sometimes don't necessarily think that that's something I'll document. You just are kind of pleased that you found it. Uh, but as we uh, pr produce this more and more, I've been trying to track that as we go. I can see the top four areas, and this is very similar to last year's presentation to council. The top four areas are things that I wanted to put into the budget or department managers felt we should put into the budget. but. Um, given the inflationary pressures that we're experiencing, um, it's, it was really a, a non-starter. So these top four are areas that we do need to have regard for. We need to ensure that our fleet is being charged out at a, an adequate hourly charge. And I think that we can pretty consistently say that it's not. And that that's why council saw those red marks uh, out at the end of a replacement schedule out in year six, year seven, those types of things on the equipment replacement schedule. We may be uh, charging our equipment out enough to pay for maintenance and fuel and insurance and things like that, but we're just not setting aside enough uh, for the roads equipment for sure. In terms of the arenas, uh, we have our uh, facility reserve to take care of the actual structures and HVAC systems and different things like that, but we don't have a reserve actually set aside for our ice plants. So whenever we're into a situation where we need to do something to our arenas, we're into um, a grant situation if we can make it happen. But if we don't have a grant, then right off the bat, we're into uh, borrowing it from our working funds, the general government reserve, or as the case was in, in Lakefield a number of years ago, we actually just went to infrastructure Ontario and had to go into debt for a number of years to, to replace the floor. Um, so the fact that we don't have that reserve set aside is, is a concern for sure. Mike and, and Mark and his crew there put together a good analysis of uh, what we have for ice plane equipment, um, what we should start setting aside, but uh, this budget doesn't allow that to happen. The other is uh, in the area of the arenas and, and what's more or less like a functional deficit at each facility, despite some of the changes Mike's been able to incorporate and in some of the energy efficiencies that we, we've been able to find. Um, on an annual basis, we have uh, deficits at both facilities. We have been using that Ontario Municipal Partnership Fund to clear them in the year afterwards, just so that we keep an eye on what those deficits are. But at a certain point, the program needs to have a rethink and uh, we need to just address the fact that these deficits, and, and it's not only in Selwyn that we're experiencing them. Uh, Selwyn uh, is, is one of many municipalities that has arenas that just experience deficits based on on the kind of that new normal of how arenas are used. And the other expenses uh, with re respect to the asset management plan software that we use, it's a GIS based uh, program. Um, it is the way that we do business now for asset management, uh, but because it's grant eligible, we are using that OSIF grant again to offset that. But in, in all reality, that's a software that we're, we're using now, it's like any other software that we use, it's the cost of doing business, and we should be able to free that grant up for some capital investment uh, down the road. So those top four, they 
you know, while they were there in the, in the early discussions, uh, and Janice and I are very much aware of them, they, they really didn't make uh, the first cut for the budget. Uh, later on, though, we got into some expenses that we could uh, reduce, uh, some user fees that we looked at and maybe did a rethink. So maybe we, you know, maybe we can be a little bit more aggressive in some of those user fees. Some operating receipts that uh, maybe we we bumped up a little bit, um, and we we went through that exercise. But you can see that the majority of the way that we were to, able to come in is using up some of our working funds, so accumulated revenue use. Uh, that didn't really get us to where we needed to be, so we went back through and, and really fine tuned uh, throughout uh, the budget. Uh, ensured that if, and I mean, I got to a point where if I thought something was going to be 275 and the account or the uh, department measure $300, well, I went to 275, that type of thing. So that process, we probably came up with about $15,000. And then at the end, we just had some additional accumulated revenue used to uh, basically look, re rethink that and try to get to a, a figure that we came at to present the council. Um, this grant funding for annual expenses. Sorry, Lane, we have a question. Okay. Councillor Boyko. Uh, thank you. Through you, uh, Madam Mayor, to, to Lane, they, when, I, when I read the, the budget documents, um, one of the things that, that I was alerted to was the ongoing arena deficits. And I, I understood the fire deficit. I understand the, the, the additional training and equipment and everything else that is, that, uh, is necessary. Um, but the arena deficit is something that... Uh, I, I, I would like to understand a little bit better. I understand too that playing hockey, figure skating, other reasons that uh, the arena is being used is, is really prohibitively expensive to, to, to folks in, in, uh, in Lakefield, Nenismore and, and all of Selwyn already. So the, the notion of increasing arena rates and rentals is one thing that I think we need to be careful about. But this ongoing deficit is something that is concerning. So, um, what, 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 what is your thought? Could you drill down on on the arena deficits and and where you how you think we got here and where you think we can get out of this situation that is unsustainable, having uh, deficits every year? Yeah. So there's there's definitely a lot to a lot to unpackage on that, and I will allow Mike to, uh, to kind of chime chime in and provide uh, some more hands-on experience there. I think I think at a high level, um, first of all, we provide taxation support to minor sports groups um, so that um, every every prime time hour that is rented at the facility is at the prime time rate. So that's whether the minor sports group is paying it or whether the taxpayer is paying it. That's more or less the commitment that we've we've made to Mike as our manager to say, you know, yes, we have an excellent minor sports program at both facilities, but don't don't kind of come back to council and say, well, it's because of that that I can't break even, um, right? So so basically, we're we're saying Mike, every every hour that's rented prime is a prime time hour. So that's council's commitment, and uh, and so Mike. Appreciate, obviously appreciates the support, and I would imagine the minor sports groups do as well. Um, one of the biggest expenditures is uh, is hydro and utilities, and so we've made significant improvements uh, for energy efficiency there, and and we have seen savings in those areas as well. And I guess the last area that I would speak to is the the actual ice uh, season. Uh, in recent years, uh, kind of a concerted effort by small communities across Ontario has resulted in the season shifting so that no longer minor sports starts when it's still summertime, but it uh, starts later in fall and runs into the, win into the winter later. And that's definitely helped our facilities for sure. So those are our three areas where I think we've seen significant um, improvements and we have had savings. Um, but I think maybe I'll leave it there and I'll turn it over to Mike to maybe provide some more insights into other areas that we could find some savings or if at the end of the day, uh, we just need to increase funding. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, Lane. Through you, Madam Mayor. Um, yeah, just, uh, I'll go through a few things that, uh, that probably will help um, 
make it more understandable right across the board and then answer any specific questions that might follow. Um, first off, um, about seven years ago, there was an arena, a small town arena association that was formed with uh, more than 400 arena managers, um, specifically talking about the fact that everybody runs at a deficit and how are we, what can we do to make sure that that doesn't, uh, doesn't happen. Um, our um, arenas have continuously dropped in the size of deficit um, in the last seven years, and uh, we can certainly provide um, some of the background that was, was done, I think in 2019, um, as sort of the last time with previous council, um, which, which uh, demonstrates how that was done and, and, and continued ways. We are always trying to increase our sponsorship, um, increase the sponsorships with the um, public skates and, uh, and then be, find efficiencies with work and with, um, with how we can run things. Um, so that, that was very much a reality of all the arenas. Uh, the second thing that that group um, tried to tackle was the fact that everybody had buildings that were made in the 70s, especially through the, um, um, well, it's called the, the Trillium Foundation now, but it was the, uh, the Lotto. Um, uh, Winterio. Uh, yeah, Winterio um, was largely funding arenas throughout Ontario in the 70s. Well, that's 50 years ago. So what's gonna happen? And that was a, a major, major concern is what are towns going to do about their 50 year old buildings that need uh, either major upgrades or replacement. So um, that, that, those two things were, were a big part of it. Um, we, we have done a, an analysis on what our actual cost per hour would be if all we did was sell the 60 hours of prime time um, every single week, what are, what, what would we need to charge? Um, and then whether we do it through, uh, the very much appreciated, um, assessment for, um, uh, access to recreation for the kids, i.e. the, the, um, subsidy, um, or whether we do it through actually charging that, um, to all groups. Um, and it's just around $275 an hour. Um, if we were to truly break even. Um, and, and we sell a lot of shoulder ice and we shall sell daytime ice and, and that, so that helps a great deal. It, it, you know, if you were able to do a perfect analysis, you could actually see if you sell 20% of that and then adjust that 275. But we've always just said primetime ice should be sold. If it is sold, it costs us 275 or it would cost us 275 if we wanted to truly break even um, every year, every time. Um, that it would be by far the highest ice rate in the county. Mm -hmm. um, we are the lowest in our deficits in the county right now. Um, and um, we're right near the top in our arenas because I think we have the best arenas. Um, I don't have any hesitation to say I would put our arenas up against anybody's, especially in how well we maintain them and how clean they are. Um, so uh, um, I, I, have, I don't have any problem charging near the top, but we are near the top and we always try and stay in and around where Peterborough and Kawartha Lakes Lindsay are. Um, if we ever tried to look at some of the other ones, Apsley is charging $80 um, to minor groups. Well, we, like, we can't do that. Ours is closer to, you know, 160, 165. Um, and, um, you know, we just, we, we, it's finding that top, that perfect balance because I don't think we want to go to 275 because I think we would see decrease in, in rentals and you would get, you guys would definitely get increase in phone calls. Um, <laughs> you're hearing how, how expensive it is for families to afford hockey now. If we add 20% to that, that goes straight to each athlete. So, um, yeah, I think that that's a, hopefully a, a bit of an overview. If there are specific questions, certainly uh, can, can uh, field them now. I have a question from uh, Deputy Mayor Black. 
Thank you. Through you, Mayor Senes. Uh, thanks, Mike. And I, I will agree with you that our arenas are some of the best uh, uh, facilities uh, in the county and, and well taken care of, always uh, clean. Um, what are the, uh, and I certainly understand your concerns around raising the rates for uh, minor hockey uh, and figure skating and those, because uh, having three kids gone through minor hockey and, and figure skating, uh, it is very, very expensive. And, and that's probably not the area that we want to focus in on. But I've had the pleasure of working with another fellow to uh, add three hours of daytime rental to the Lakeville restaurant. Uh, restaurant. I must be hungry. Um, <laughs> the Lakefield Arena, in the last two years, we're, we're doing, uh, we've got two one and a half hour um, seniors groups playing hockey, uh, some women, men as well, you know, together. And so I think, you know, that when you consider the senior population of our municipality and, and the area in general, promoting more daytime rentals will certainly, certainly keep uh, the deficit number uh, lower. So I wonder if there's an opportunity there from the municipality to try and promote, uh, and I'm certainly going to try and move this to a 14 league next year and add another three hours to daytime rentals uh, for seniors, uh, uh, shinny hockey. Um, but also, so that's one area I think that if we did a little bit more promotion and maybe worked with people like Bruce Avril, who's who's trying to do some of this stuff, to try and get more daytime uh, rentals uh, to help reduce the deficit. But also, my question really is about the hall upstairs uh, as another opportunity to grow rentals in the facility. What's the state of, of rental? What's the occupancy percentage? Uh, what types of events? are we promoting there? I know having a daughter going through a wedding this summer, weddings are very expensive and um, rent hall rentals for those things are, it's completely over the top. Uh, and there's a lot of folks obviously can't afford uh, to rent a fancy hall, but are there opportunities to grow rentals in the hall upstairs, again, to help subsidize uh, some of the uh, the um, the rates for, uh, for prime time that we're providing? Uh, through you, Madam Mayor, um, you're absolutely right. The uh, the really good opportunities are daytime. We thought we had wooed over the uh, 12 team league that um, that um, couldn't run their league in Peterborough during COVID. Um, the restrictions were a little bit different. Their their cleaning times and the fact that the with the twin pad they were really while well, they also did shut down one arena and had um, uh, living spaces in there. So they they had to ask their senior groups um or um i'm not sure senior is, is the word that's i don't know what the pc term is but um the older older athletes um, it's the senior had, hockey league mike you're just fine <laughs> okay so senior hockey league, um we were really hoping that that would that they would stay with us because we really did well uh bruce and his group and uh, and a couple other are, are doing quite well but that is the 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 one area where we regularly have time. Um, so anything we can fill in there is just is a, absolutely amazing. We've done better and better. And, and if that team does go to four, if that league does go to four, that would be great. I think the opportunity, and, and we've talked about this, about having somebody who strictly does our uh, sponsorships, our events, and um, I would like it to be somebody who, if we ever do go to that, also does leagues. Um, because if you can run your own leagues, you can actually charge uh, charge a, a decent price and you make money off of every athlete that's out there. So if you've got 15 athletes and they all pay $1,000, that's $15,000. Divide that by 20, uh, 20 games and all of a sudden you're, you're making you know, several hundred dollars per hour um, and, and they're getting a decent rate. They're not, you know, they're not um, thinking that they're overpaying for, for something. So um, that the hall rentals absolutely are opportunities and coming out of COVID, we've done quite well. Um, it, we're starting to see the rentals come back. Uh, for a while, it was really, really, it was really down. Um, and, um, you know, we certainly promo them in local. Uh, we're getting some more help from the um, tourism and and, uh, and economic development and, and hope to work with the new CEO uh, about that, about promoting that a great deal because the building's open. 
it, we've got staff. It really is the simplest thing for us to do is just set up some chairs and then go up and clean up afterwards. Um, there's always the hesitancy of, of having alcohol events because it does open the township up to a certain uh, degree of liability. So we always have to make sure that we organize and supervise those very well. But uh, there's lots of events that, uh, that are available. And, and as I said, we're doing better and better on those all the time, whether it's, uh, whether it's uh, pizza parties for teams or whether it's um, uh, line dancing over in Ennismore, things are picking up a great deal on that. Um, we're just going to, uh, we will just continue to try and find whatever ways, whether it's online, whether it's uh, through social media, um, blast outs, um, getting the message to people just seems to be the toughest thing. We have, we have too many media opportunities um, and where to spend the money to let people know that they're available is, is such a tough, uh, tough challenge. Um, we have a question from Councillor Coolis. Thanks, through you. Um, my question kind of falls back to the seniors and I know we're talking short term right now with this tax year, but are there any shifting population dynamics that we should consider? Like, are there gonna be an increase of seniors who may be using during the daytime that are coming from the nighttime and prime time? hours that we need to think about? Um, are there like going to be an increase of kids coming into the hockey that we need to think about? Um, and how might that in maybe the medium term um, impact prices? Like, do you have any info on that? Um, I, I can't say I would, I would have specific information on those trends. Um, it's, it's things that, that we certainly try and look into. Um, typically as a group of, of, uh, of arena managers, um, but, uh, the, we see that practically that there definitely has been a shift in Ennismore, especially more to youth and, and that they've been growing in both the girls hockey and in the, in the, uh, EMHA every year. And, and I don't see that trending the other way just yet. Um, if the curling club is any, is any indication now we have more members that curl during the day than we have that curl at night. Um, so if that trend is true, um, carrying forward to, uh, carrying forward to the ice rentals, um, then, uh, then it is something to be mindful of. Um, you know, it, it is a, a ever fluctuating change. You know, it wasn't that many years ago that Lakefield had the, the big, big numbers in the minor hockey and Dennis Moore was, was struggling now. It, it really is the, is the opposite. Um, so, uh, yeah, keeping track of provincial and, and national trends are, are something we try and uh, try and uh, find. But um, really talking to the associations and seeing what their registrations are like, um, what they look like for numbers of teams in the in the upcoming year. Um, there are a couple of things that, that some townships have done that I, I probably should have mentioned during the first part of this answer, and that is charge. A uh, bit of a surcharge to out of town teams. Um, we're one of the few that don't right now. Um, more than 50% of the other townships are charging a um, an out of town or a non resident fee, um, and that is a consideration. You know, it's certainly uh, when our teams go out um, to other places, whether it's uh, whether it's Duro Dummer or whether it's um, Kawartha Lakes, they do pay a, a surcharge to go there. So that is certainly a possibility. Um, but uh, yeah, the, the, other than that, the, the rental rate, we don't want to exceed that ceiling of, of, of going into the highest, but we're always within a dollar or two of Peterborough. Thank you, Mike. I have a question from Councillor Henry. Thank you, Mayor Sennis, and through you. Um, Mike, we, we have a number of facilities that um, have halls in them. Uh, the new new police station with the, the den um, in Lakefield, Marshland Center, Bridge North Library. Um, I think we have too many halls or maybe we're just not uh, thinking beyond the, the possibilities for them. And I keep hearing about pickleball. Um, CBC Radio this morning was pickleball and communities, um, th this is a very fast growing trend. Can some of these halls be used as a pickleball courts? I don't know, just curious. 
Um, through you, uh, Madam Mayor. Um, unfortunately, none of them have the ceiling height or the couple that are a little bit taller um, don't have the, because the river den would be the, would be the tallest or at least on one side, but it's not 20 by 40. So uh, the, um, yeah, the, the unfortunately, uh, even though we've offered them to pickleball, they would much rather look to try and go in the schools or go to uh, the wellness center or, uh, or go to Trent. Um, we just don't like the arenas are the only things that have the, the ceiling heights, but by that time they can go outside. Sorry. By that time they can, by the time we, our arenas are available for floor rentals, they can go outside, which is, which is their preference um, largely. So, yeah, unfortunately, it is a growing sport without a question, and it's crossed over to uh, to all ages. It really was very much a 60 and older sport, but it's crossed over and and doing quite well. But uh, yeah, we just don't have the the ceiling height required. All right, it looks like we don't have any further questions on this slide. So, Lane. Okay, thank you, Madam Mayor. Oh, my, it looks like my screen is frozen up here. Mike's uh, talk long enough that my screen is actually frozen. <laughs> Let's see what I can do. There we go. Hopefully that's moved for council. Okay, so we're on to uh, department highlights and uh, some of the next steps of, of where we're going to go there. Uh, obviously, this section is a, a large section on the binder, around eight, 85 pages, uh, but hopefully councils have a chance to go through that. We can obviously review and clarify as we work through, but I'll just use the uh, slide deck as a, a means of working through by department. Uh, review the highlights really there as, as it relates to any of the impacts. And in some instances, the, the binder provides not only the dollar impact, but uh, maybe impacts as it relates to effort and time. And that's that section beyond dollars and cents in some of the departments that you'll see. Uh, but obviously, uh, we'll have a chance to add any additional questions uh, as we go through this section. In uh, general government, um, we've, we're fortunate to have uh, interest rates rebounding from the pandemic. Um, Throughout that period of time, we actually saw a significant reduction in our in our general account, um, many times less than one percent. Um, and given some of the approaches that we took in terms of tax collection and uh, some of the approaches during uh, council's uh, community support um, period, um, we didn't necessarily see uh, taxation uh, penalties and interest uh, either. Uh, but I'm pleased to say that in this budget, it is returning. Uh, so we uh, over $200,000 of new um, interest income that's coming in. We're, we are kind of uh, conservative in that, in that number, uh, but at the same time, uh, hoping that the interest rates will stay up there in around that 5% uh, number for us. Um, we have some funds invested with a, a, an arm of CIBC we have others invested with CIBC, our banker in GICs, um, and then some with our current account. We have a very good uh, um, uh, setup with our current account as well in terms of interest amount. Uh, so that's that's probably the biggest area in general government uh, and we're rebounding after that pandemic. Of course, we do have those significant insurance impacts that, that hits general governments particularly hard uh, as it relates to liability uh, errors and omissions, those parts of our premium. And we see that also in the building department and in uh, in roads as well. Um, of course, in this area over the last few years, we've been implementing uh, significant technology improvements. Um, but the, the other um, part of the technology is that it's kind of changing how we pay for technology. So it used to be that you would purchase, uh, I'll use maybe Windows as an example, you'd, you'd purchase Windows, you'd use Windows for four or five years, you may have some uh, some support on that, and then four or five years later, they would issue a whole new um, 
uh, addition of windows need by that. So that was all funded through our capital program. Almost every um, software provider that we use now uh, uses the subscription-based approach. And so you're paying now an annual subscription and, and that's what happens say, with Microsoft 365. So we now pay for that monthly. So what that does for us from a financing perspective is it moves it from the capital budget and over into the operating budget. So we're seeing those impacts as well as it relates to uh, technology. So while we are seeing efficiencies and time savings, we're seeing now annual expenditures where we may not have seen that before. Um, I, I will say that through maximizing a virtual town hall and really encouraging folks to sign up to pre-authorized payments um, or um, do online banking, uh, we're actually seeing the amount of uh, funds through the office decrease. And uh, a lot of our work now is more uh, on EFTs and uh, files coming in from the banks and stuff like that. So that's definitely where we're starting to see a shift in how um, we handle that from a human resource perspective up front. Uh, definitely in this department as well, we've got, uh, this is where we see our, our finance administration and uh, anything to do with legislation. So there's, we're having human resource impacts in this area as well. Excuse me, Lane. Um, I'm not sure if uh, Councillor Henry has a question. You do? Thank you, through you, Mayor Sanis. Um, insurance keeps popping up in a lot of the conversations. Um, and in the January 17th council meeting, um, Clerk Angela Chittick uh, kind of presented our insurance program for us. Um, and Intact is our provider. It was discussed, or it was mentioned at that meeting that our, our insurance provider went out and searched for other insurance companies for us uh, and possibilities and came back and apparently there weren't any, only them. Um, I'm just curious why we, we would rely on one of our service providers to uh, uh, go looking or con try to contract out maybe an RFQ or RFP um, for services and, and they're the service provider. I find that um, rather curious why we wouldn't look ourselves, whether it's their Olmex or McDougal that specializes in rural communities. Why, why we relied, relied on that input from Intact instead of uh, sussing it out ourselves because they still have our insurance. Sure, to, to you, Madam Mayor, I'll, I'll probably get to, probably get a clerk, Angie, to, to chime in on, on this as well. But uh, we actually use a, a broker, Canada Broker Link. Um, so they're our broker. Uh, they definitely deal with Intact uh, specifically, but uh, we're back and forth with our broker um, asking the questions and they, they manage uh, that insurance portfolio for us, if you will. Uh, but I'll maybe get Angie to uh, to comment on generally the insurance industry specific to the public sector. Uh, yeah, th uh, thanks, Lane. Um, that's exactly right. We actually didn't um, go directly to impact uh, um, or intact, sorry. Uh, we went through our broker uh, to look at some other insurance providers. And there really are very limited options for uh, municipal insurers. Um, there's, there's maybe three or four of them in the marketplace. So where, uh, like as a, as a residential customer, you probably have a lot more options. Municipalities have a, a lot fewer options, quite frankly. Um, there aren't that many insurers who want to bid on municipal business. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, we aren't the only municipality that is uh, suffering with this. It seems to be across the board. Um, I have a question from Deputy Mayor Black. Thank you, Mayor Sennett. Yeah, I just, you know, I'll reiterate what you were saying. Uh, when we were at Roma last week or a few days ago, uh, it did come up there with by several municipalities. Uh, there seems to be a reluctance uh, from insurers to insure municipalities. So. There was a question to the minister in the minister's uh, panel uh, asking whether it was a feasibility to do a reciprocal insurance with all municipalities, creating their own insurance uh, as well, because everybody's um, having significant increases from the available insurers, and uh, it may be time for municipalities to look at creating their own insurance. So uh, great question, uh, Councillor Henry.
Okay, for you, Madam Mayor, I'll maybe just carry on then to uh, the next department. Looks like it looks like every time I actually uh, go to stop, things will freeze up on me. There we go. So on to fire service. Um, we, we have had declining uh, fire revenues uh, over the last number of years with respect to motor vehicle accidents. Uh, we, we bill those out to the insurance companies and in some instances they, they are paid, uh, but we find if, if uh, we don't receive fairly prompt payment within the quarter, then we know that there's a concern and that insurance company is probably not going to pay or that maybe no claim was ever submitted to that insurance company. So those, those amounts have declined over the years and um, definitely as, as fire chief has outlined several years uh, in a row, but he's seeing that across the, across the, the board in that sector. We have had uh, revenues, though, with respect to our municipal fire agreements, stay fairly consistent or increase a bit. Of course, that does depend on annual responses, but we have a, a an annual agreement with Curve Lake and uh, consistently have an agreement there where we, uh, we charge Curve Lake on an annual basis. And then if there are any responses into our Dummer or City of Corta Lakes, then our, uh, our fire service responds, and then we're able to bill that out uh, with the equipment time and, and uh, uh, firefighter time as well. So uh, those revenues have stayed uh, fairly strong in that department. Uh, we're still uh, looking at the fire service delivery review that came in a few years ago, and we uh, this budget actually completes the organizational change with the hiring of the uh, deputy fire chief. Uh, so that's now fully implemented. Uh, but uh, this department is definitely one of those ones where we're seeing increasing operating costs across the department, whether it be insurance, communications, equipment maintenance. Um, and obviously we have a large uh, reserve transfer. We were able to increase our reserve transfer this year by a nominal $5,000 to keep, keep up with the replacement schedule. But when we're seeing the type of prices that are coming in on the equipment in the fire service, and uh, personal protective equipment, SCBA, those types of things. It's uh, the prices are, are just uh, increasing extraordinarily. Uh, and as uh, was re referenced earlier as well, the training requirements uh, of the fire service. So uh, definitely fire service training and the responses of the fire service uh, to motor vehicle accidents, to uh, medical calls, those types of things uh, has increased quite a bit and we're seeing the cost of living in, uh, increase uh, affect all of our volunteer firefighters here as well. We have approximately 90 volunteer firefighters, and half a dozen full-time in the department as well. So those are the types of expenses that we're seeing uh, resulting in that large uh, tax support increase in the fire service. Now over to uh, uh, the, the building department bylaw enforcement. I'll maybe just pause there. Uh, I see that there's a hand up. Deputy Mayor Block. Yeah, thank you for you, Mayor Sennis Delant. Um, the Slater's Corners um, uh, Hall, uh, I was a little surprised to see it still in action uh, after the uh, 2000 amalgamation. Prior to 2000, it was an active hall in Selwyn, and then with the uh, wonderful hall in, in Lakefield, it was somewhat put, taken out of commission as far as an active hall. It looks like that old uh, building is still being used for storage, so I wonder if there's an opportunity there to look at uh, the future of that. Uh, it's more of a garage than, than a hall, from what I remember, uh, whether uh, it's still really uh, required. It looks like it's just uh, storing uh, stuff right now. Uh, possibly an opportunity to uh, sell it to a neighbor. I don't think it's a full-size residential lot, but uh, potentially selling it to a neighbor or something like that could uh, draw some revenue into the township and, uh, you know, the, um, the fire department could possibly do some storage somewhere else. But uh, it's a very, very old building and at some point uh, is going to be uh, costly to maintain. So just if you have any comments on that one, thanks. Well, um, it, it is a solid structure for sure, and uh, we have invested in the, in a new roof um, in the last five years or so. Uh, it's a steel roof, so that should do it service well into the future. 
And I do know that it is, it is definitely extensively used for storage. It's chock full of last uh, I talked to Gord about. Um, I'm not sure if uh, the chief has, uh, wants to weigh in on the, on the significance of Slater's Hall at this point. Yeah, <clears throat> through you, Mayor Sanis. Ron, yeah, like at this point, there's a generator there. Uh, there is quite a number of pieces of tools that, you know, are, that we keep for spares that, you know, right now, the other halls are pretty well jammed <laughs> to the pack where, you know, we really don't have the space to put more in. Uh, because Hall 1 is a, a come to fire hall and bridge north for everything else, for supplies, we're short of space here. So at this point, I, you know, I, I can see, yeah, that definitely a chunk of land in the future that say for expansion, that, you know, save for a, a sewage pump property or something like that. Eh? But you could actually build a house. It, it looks narrow, but it's long and you could probably build something on it in the future. But at this point, if we could keep that for storage and if you've seen what was in it, <laughs> yeah, you go a gate. So there's stuff in there. Yeah, we definitely got to get rid of. There's no doubt about it, but there's a lot of stuff that uh, say even for the, for the firefighter uh, association where we keep our barbecues and everything else for the dues we do Ron. So, yeah. you, know, you know, it's definitely something that could be looked at in the future for, you know, for purpose, even for the township purposes, let alone for, for sale. So, yeah. sure. thank you, Joplin. That's a good explanation. Appreciate it. And uh, before I go to Councillor Coolis for her question, I just wanted to mention to Council that I've requested that we have a um, tour of our fire halls at some point in time um, this year. Councillor Coolis. Thanks through you. Um, I'm just curious, the annual fire conference, it's $10,000. Can you tell us what that actually captures? Uh, through Mayor Senate. Uh, actually, Mary, that takes in account uh, probably more than just the fire, or just the, the, that. So that'll be for fire prevention, uh, training officer, uh, attends conferences. That'll be for how and I attend the, the annual uh, chiefs meeting in November and then there's then there's the one in April too that's the it's the big show and stuff so it, it takes in with you know we put 10,000 in there we may use like I don't think we've used anything more than four or five the last few years oh, you know, there been any meetings so but now the things are livening up uh, just for instance just for how and I was uh, almost 2000 a little over two thousand dollars each just to go to the annual meeting in November in Niagara so like everything else it just got the point ridiculous you know I can remember when I first started I, I don't think it was five hundred dollars to go for four days so <laughs> now it's everything else so okay thank you see no further questions Lane Okay, I'm just uh, once again having a little technology issue here. Okay, uh, moving on to building and bylaw enforcement. Um, uh, these areas are under uh, Robert Kelly's responsibilities. Um, and as uh, we move forward with the service delivery review in this area. Uh, the recommendation was for full-time bylaw enforcement. So we uh, we move forward with that. And I can say from a taxation perspective, that's now fully implemented in this budget. Um, with respect to building fees, we did uh, have a, um, in the budget, we proposed a CPI increase on permit fees in accordance with the, uh, the policy. Uh, but uh, Robert is going to do a review of our, our new methodology there for charging out uh, building permits on square footage as opposed to property values. We did see a, a fairly significant impact this year in the building fees that came in. So that coupled with the uh, bit of a slowdown that we saw in the last quarter of this year means that we had to pull quite a bit more out of the contingency reserve and building than we had anticipated for sure. Um, but specific to taxation, I can say that the taxation support that goes to this department is now 
completed the phase in of that bylaw enforcement section. Over to uh, Public Works. Uh, obviously, human resource pressure is here because it's one of our larger uh, departments. Um, so, uh, some impact of the remuneration review, but also cost of living in increases, insurance impact, which I mentioned uh, previously, um, and material costs um, in this area. We're, we're seeing uh, with respect to resurfacing and some of those things, the amount of increases, uh, I would say that Rick hasn't seen them in his career for sure, uh, still followed the pandemic and, uh, and some of the concerns that we're having um, on supply chain issues. Um, we were not able to address that hourly equipment charge, um, but that is something that we'll be looking at this year. And I think uh, Adam is going to set aside some time to, to meet with Scott Kufeld and some of the guys over there and actually chat, chat that through a little bit this year. Once again, I apologize to council. I just seem to be freezing up here, but I'll, uh, I've got a bit of a process here where I can clear that up. <laughs> Uh, over to winter control. Um, sanding and salting typically dominates winter control operations, but we do have those large storms that come in every so often. And uh, um, not only the storm itself and the uh, the need for the for the gang to be out on the roads uh, more often, but also the cleanup that comes after the fact. So uh, in 2022, we uh, were well over our uh, budget that was established. Part of that is from the um, the uh, winter storm event, but a lot of it is also from filling up both of the domes with sand, uh, treated sand and salt. So we had to uh, go into our winter control contingency reserve in 2022, a little over $126,000. Um, and so that means we start the year without uh, any deficit in this area, but at the same time, um, we did have to, to uh, borrow from that reserve uh, fairly, fairly heavily. Uh, still in public works, but uh, a new department structures. Uh, and this is coming out of our asset management review and, and the, a new asset class uh, that came up in our discussions and that uh, um, we have always been under the impression that the county took care of all uh, structures and bridges in the county of Peterborough. Uh, it was only through a detailed review that and some discussions with the one uh, newer member of the county that we discovered there's actually a um, a small pocket of structures between three meters and six meters, which the lower tier municipality is responsible for. Um, for Salwan, we, we did some review. We met with our, our engineer who did a study and uh, yeah, we have about seven uh, structures that meet that definition. Um, the approximate uh, replacement value is $2.5 million. So this is a, a new area um, for the budget. With respect to some capital repairs that we need to make at two of the structures, we are, it's a little over $66,000, I think. We're, we're pulling out of the Ontario Municipal Partnership Fund. So with respect to that capital, we're actually funding that through a grant. Uh, but we do need to get some tax levy support in to take care of uh, some of the work that we need to do in the structures um, because there is a legislative requirement that we, we do that on an annual basis. And there's also a requirement that every two years, uh, an engineer actually provides us with a review. And so uh, this year, we also established a small transfer to reserve. And then next year, the engineering review would be there as well. Uh, Lane, I see there's a question from Deputy Mayor Black. Thank you, through you, Mayor Sennis. Uh, Lane, when uh, Mayor Sennis and I were on the uh, county tour, of facilities and structures, we pulled into uh, the dome across the road from the center line, uh, our, our, our center line dome and, and works facility. And there was comments made on the bus that there isn't actually a building on uh, the county uh, dome side uh, that staff could use. Uh, there's no um, washing facility for their trucks. They have to take their trucks down to the Dural uh, site to do that. Is there any opportunity on the uh, on our side of uh, center line to share some costs with them uh, in our building uh, and allow them to use some our building for some of their 
or a bathroom, for instance. They don't have a bathroom at that site for, for staff to use in the wintertime. Because um, I do believe they are thinking about putting a structure up on that on that site, which would be very, very costly to the county. And there's only one taxpayer. And is there an opportunity to share some of our facility or add to our facility there to, uh, to uh, have county staff uh, um, use that as their office uh, for their uh, for their dome as well. Just thought. Yeah. So, so this has definitely been a, an issue that's come up. Uh, I would say more so in the last two or three years, for sure, in terms of discussion. We we've chatted about it here. We've chatted with county staff. I know Rick's reached out to the county staff and provided some some options on how that could occur. There are definitely some challenges with respect to that because uh, uh, you know. We, they, their uh, service is different than ours. Um, we have our trucks inside, they would want theirs inside. Um, different things at the actual structure as to who has access at what time of the day, things like that. Uh, so we have had some ongoing discussions on that. I think that really, I think the last time we had uh, thrown it back to the county staff for some uh, feedback to us and we haven't yet received any feedback on that. So definitely is is something that we've been discussing and there may be some opportunities there. So it's definitely not a dead issue to us, but uh, nothing just kind of right at the edge of, of moving forward at this point. Great, thanks, thanks Lane. Okay, uh, still with, with Public Works, but moving on from, from roads and that, and that area over into waste management. Um, as I outlined, there are collection contract definitely increasing this year as we carry on with the ongoing clear bag implementation. Um, so our, our expenses in this area are largely driven by uh, those increases with respect to uh, collection. Uh, but we have seen a decline in tipping weights and I distributed uh, something yesterday just in terms of a graph to council just to, to show them um, the areas where we're, we're decreasing. And I think I noted in my email that brush had actually dropped off, but uh, there was a, a period of time last year after the storm where we allowed for free brush uh, drop off. So the, obviously without the storm, we wouldn't have had that brush, but there was obviously some brush that came in over the scales at that point in time, which would have garnered some tipping fee as well. Uh, so that had a bit of an impact as well. What's being proposed in the in the budget is an increase in tipping fees uh, mid-year, which is uh, when we typically have brought the other phased in increases in. Um, there's an ongoing increase in the brush tipping fee uh, included in the budget as well. Um, and uh, just despite that, um, we still are, are seeing that the um, taxation support needs to actually support some of that facility. Uh, I will say that the food cycler program uh, pilot doesn't have, is, it's not being funded through taxation. So uh, that program as a pilot is not a part of the tax increase for this year. I see a question from Deputy Mayor Black. Thank you to you, uh, Mayor Sennis. Uh, in looking at the uh, the waste management budget, it, you're, you know, tipping fees are going to be down by about, I think it was $22,000, but, and cost, to operate the facility area are going to be up almost $28,000. So just for, and, in addition, we have, you know, the addition to the contract for collection on top of that. But if you look at just the facility itself, it's about a $50,000 deficit this year operating the landfill site. And, you know, while I understand deficits in arenas uh, because of uh, cost for families and so on, I, I really feel that uh, our waste management site should operate uh, on a flatline basis, uh, you know, that uh, the costs are recovered for using, uh, for dumping garbage uh, in our landfill site. And I understand there are increases in the rates going into effect this year in June. I wonder if there's an opportunity to take another look at um, the, uh, the, the uh, per ton uh, weight uh, um, um, formula that you're using as well as maybe moving the increase up a quarter to, to March to help generate some more revenue uh, to reduce that $50,000 deficit to something closer to, uh, to cost. Uh, I wonder what your thoughts on that are. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, definitely whenever we have the opportunity to use user fees um, 
to offset. Uh, we definitely do that if we can. Um, in this area, that's that's definitely why we're proposing the increase to uh, to stay current with the uh, Bensford uh, increases. We want to ensure that we're right uh, around Bensford weights are a little higher, so that uh, it doesn't uh, attract uh, waste that shouldn't be going to our landfill site. Um, we've we've traditionally phased in any increases there over a period of time. We've tried to get that out in social media. Uh, we would have some changes at the scale that we would need to make as well. Um, and that's definitely the approach we're taking this year. We, we've we just uh, increased it at the same time that we typically would increase June 1st. Um, we, we could uh, maybe look at that June 1st date. We could look at the amount that we're increasing to, to the same as Bedford. So I think there's some opportunity there. Um, I will say though that uh, it, I don't think we could erase uh, the amount in, in one year unless we take some significant uh, swipes at user fees and when we're going to implement. And the other would be that despite these increases, we still have no uh, working funds left at the end of the year. So um, it might be my uh, suggestion that if we do that, uh, I could spend some time with uh, Randy and Adam and, uh, and Janice. We could maybe go through a bit of a report, bring back to council at a later date in terms of an additional increase or uh, some additional fees, but that any of that uh, type of um, increase would just help uh, at the facility and we would carry on and any, obviously if we ever got to a situation where we had better than a break even, then we put that aside for working funds uh, in waste management. Yeah, sorry, through you, Mayor Sanders again. Yeah, I, again, I do believe that this is a service that should be paid uh, by those that use it. Uh, we're you were making significant efforts uh, to improve recycling and reduce garbage. Uh, and uh, so those that are using that facility, I think should pay for it as well. So anything we can do to help offset some of that deficit this year, which is seems to be growing like the arenas, uh, I think we have to look at it uh, sooner than later. So appreciate you uh, taking a look at that. Okay, um, that kind of finishes up with the public works area of the budget over into parks and arenas. Um, uh, obviously, remuneration again, because it's a service industry, cost of living impacts. We do, we do have uh, those increasing operating costs, uh, costs across the department, and we are seeing some changes with respect to some of our contractors, but uh, Mostly it's any of the materials that Mike needs to purchase, whether it's at the arenas or out in the uh, parks and recreation area. And then uh, the uh, the other larger area there with respect to increased taxation and support is just following through on our uh, support at the arenas. And um, Mike goes to the calculation as it relates to uh, arena hours of minor sports. We also support, uh, supply support for the accessibility guidelines, AODA, elevator costs, those types of things. And while we don't put money aside for the ice plants, we do set aside uh, money on an annual basis in the reserve for the replacement of the ice uh, resurfacers as well. And that's where the tax support goes there. Okay, another area in terms of recreation and culture is now over into library services. Uh, we are seeing the, the primary impact here is the remuneration review that was done last year. We still have uh, um, five of our six staff there that are not full-time employees. Uh, they are 32 and a half hours a week. Um, originally, it's been uh, thought that we would suggest to the library board that, um, that that change would take place this year, but just given the, the impact of remuneration review and the cost of living increases, that's been deferred. Uh, this year. So we have a new board that will be coming in place. They'll be putting forward a new strategic plan and, and looking at maybe some new metrics in terms of how do we capture the library impact in our community. Um, and of course, we're still continuing with that volunteer model. So we, the great thing about the library is it has a large reach out into the community with all of their volunteers that uh, uh, are involved. Um, but we have supports involved to, that we need to review to support that volunteer model. So we're looking at that as well. And I think that generally uh, some of the trends so that volunteers are now looking at more short-term commitments and uh, maybe they would commit 
more full-time hours, but for a shorter period of time. We're starting to see that maybe a little bit uh, emerge after the pandemic in particular. So a lot more falling back on the staff there to ensure that the branches are open and that ensure that we're able to provide service on an ongoing basis. Of course, this is another area where technology plays a, a key role and uh, Sarah and her staff there have really embraced technology and uh, we're able to come through the pandemic and provide just excellent service to the community. So that walks us really quickly through uh, the summary uh, by department. That's obviously a highlight, uh, a lot of detail in there that uh, our, our, our managers have provided for the narratives. And I want to thank Angie and Janice for the work that they did uh, on that as well. Um, and I just have a few closing remarks on that section before I move on, but I see a hand up. Yes, um, Councillor Boyko. Okay, I'm looking at a summary by department. So do you want me to wait until the next section, Lynn, to ask this question? I uh, no, no, if you wanted to ask that now, that's okay. Okay, I'll, I'll jump ahead then, because I'm looking at uh, department um, six, property and facility improvement. And it relates to the police building. And, and um, so I'm looking at page 10 of the summary, um, Department 6. And I'm looking at the police services building. And I'm seeing that uh, 2022, 370, about 375K in expenses, where next year it's jumping to 1.4 million. That seems to be an awful, so perhaps you could explain that. Sure. So, um, yeah, so that uh, area of the budget is specifically our capital program. So that's the uh, investments that we're making there at the corner of Bridge and Queen, uh, the Chamber of Commerce building. So okay. the, what we often refer to as the police services building, we obviously will have to update that for, for next year's budget because police is now down at the river dam, but that's the Chamber of Commerce renovation that's there. So we do have a significant grant that's coming in there, about 750000 I think. Uh, but then the majority of the rest of that is coming from uh, our facility reserve and some from the sustainability reserve as well for energy efficiencies. Okay, I understand now. I guess what we need is a, a new name for that building so we know what we're talking about. Okay, thank you. Indeed, uh, through you, Mayor, I, I think that's on Mike's uh, list for this year, much the same as uh, the old scout building became the River Den. I would expect we'd probably take a look at that as well. Yeah. All right, uh, are there any other questions on the department summary? Seeing none, Lane, you were going to make a statement. I just, yeah, I just wanted to close this uh, department out by just uh, once again, thanking Angie and Janice. They, they do a, a lot of work on weaving the words in to the numbers. And, and uh, I, I like the way that the document reads in terms of marrying up the words and the numbers to explain our plans and take our work plans and, uh, and bring it to life. Um, it also tells the story where we're investing our time and effort this year, as well as the finances. Um, so once again, I hope that that was a good read for council. It basically tells us what we're doing for the, the remainder of this year. All right, I'll move over now to uh, area rates. Uh, the Orca levy is, is obviously outside of our budget control other than we have um, received it and, uh, and didn't have any concerns in that. Uh, that came from Orca in November. Um, and so that's the requirement that they send it over. Uh, their portion uh, related to Solwyn did go up 1.9%, uh, but that's only their portion of the levy. Um, <clears throat> so we don't actually add the Orca levy in. We, we treat it as an external levy because this council doesn't have care and control over that. That is something though that we need to have regard for when we go through our tax going process. And then we looked at the OPP costs in our, in our rural wards. So we did have an adjustment for the 2021 uh, year end. So the OPP adjustments are always two years behind uh, our current year that we're dealing with. That charge was an additional $23,000 on top of the contract. So that's after they go through a reconciliation. Uh, and that would impact the accumulated revenue that's coming forward uh, for the OPP. We did receive the estimate from the OPP and uh, the impact is really well on our Smith and Ennismore awards. Uh, and as uh, we have in the past, we ensured that the area rate matched the current estimate uh, for the OPP. 
And so when we do that, uh, we actually have an area rate levy decrease uh, for the OPP in 2023. Any of the other uh, operating costs um, that we have in that department uh, are covered either through a reduction in the accumulated revenue or other operating uh, receipts that may come in. So for instance, we have a ride grant that would offset any of the, any of the ride expenditures that we have. They have a reduction, they provide us with a grant for any charges related to courtroom security that the OPP may be involved in. And uh, then we have some miscellaneous receipts that come in from the detachment office and we use those to offset costs of uh, community policing and uh, having the, uh, the office over in Bridgeport. So that's the OPP area rate. Then we have police costs in Lakefield and of course we're operating under a contractual relationship now with the uh, Peterborough Police. Their schedule of costs was received just recently and uh, their schedule C is, is in, uh, increasing by 3%. Uh, I'm pleased to say once again, we didn't receive any additional chargebacks uh, from the city in 2022. Uh, and we, Jennifer, I would have, would have heard uh, about that by now. And we have a very minimal increase in 2023 uh, in this area. Uh, but as you'll see in a few slides coming up, that increase, um, given the fact that it's very small, almost at a break even, is more than offset by the assessment increases that we were able to apply against that. So we, we get over to what is the impact on the typical homeowner. Um, and uh, I will say that um, the amount that we're using this year, as I mentioned at the very start, the amount for the typical homeowner hasn't changed. So we're looking at about $314,000 for the typical homeowner based on CVA assessment. So this is not, I mean, not the value that they would get on the open market at this point in time, but just what their CVA is uh, in terms of um, the amount that we apply the tax rate against. Um, has spent some time chatting with uh, the staff in my department, Erica, and specifically who's looking at providing some additional information to council at some point in terms of uh, mathematical average and mean of a homeowner in our, based on our assessment rule, the median uh, assessment, that type of thing. But for this year, we've stayed true to the typical homeowner value that we've used over the last number of years. And just a reminder, there is no reassessment. So there's really no change in CBA this year for that uh, typical homeowner. So when we look rural, and we have to look at this in two different ways, rural because of the OPP area rate and then uh, Lakefield in terms of the Lakefield rate, this is where we look at the impact. So, um, and, and I understand that there's uh, different numbers that are reported in the media um, and uh, we try to be consistent as municipal treasurers, but um, we have a net tax levy and that's what I've talked about all through so far because we're dealing with the, the net amount of uh, expense and that was 4.86%. But then we need to take that levy and apply it across all tax classes. And so it affects everybody differently, a commercial rate payer, industrial. Uh, and here we're applying it against a residential class, but we're looking again at our typical homeowner. So when we apply that levy, we are seeing that the municipal tax increase for the year is $38. So an increase of 5.17%. But then because of the OPP decrease, it's actually going down and related to the OPP rate, a uh, decrease of 2.18%. So the impact of everything we've talked about today is an increase of 3.52% or $33.35 to the typical homeowner. So that's the impact of all those inflationary things we talked about, remuneration, cost of living, uh, the reserves that we've set aside for capital investments, all that. When we go to the, the village, a typical homeowner, we're using that same value, um, same uh, general municipal increase, um, but then the police area right here decreases as well. Uh, it's a decrease of 1.13%. And uh, keep in mind that the police overall, the amount that we pay for policing uh, per capita or per household in, in Lakeville is higher. That's maybe why we see a bigger uh, impact. Uh, and because of that, the municipal homeowner here in the village sees an increase of $32.50 on an annual basis. That increases 2.66%. So those two slides are, are typically the one that 
council is is wondering about when we look over the budget process and when we get a phone call from that repair that's saying what are my taxes going up this year then that's the type of information that's um, beneficial to council to explain uh, all these other areas that we've talked about but this is the impact to the typical homeowner at that value and so as i mentioned we are looking at providing other comparables uh, other types of assessment uh, i do know that some municipalities provide the rate increase per hundred thousand of assessment. Um, we are in a position because there isn't a current value assessment change where we could do that this year and we can work that up in short order. So when I provide some additional information to council later on the impacts of the other county rates and school rates and things like that, I could provide that at that time as well. It's a little bit trickier when we're in a reassessment year and when we're phasing because the hundred thousand dollars of assessment isn't static. It isn't the same this year as it was last year. That changes, but should be able to provide some additional information there. And so finally, we just get to a, uh, I have a recommendation later, uh, which is, was outlined in the report, but that's the PowerPoint presentation. Um, there are probably other questions from the budget uh, and the management teams available for any additional inquiries as well. So I just wanted to thank uh, you, Mayor Sennis, and the members of council for their attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Lane. and. Um, I think you, your staff, the management have done a lot of hard work to put the budget together as you always do. And your format has always been superior and easy to read. And again, this was an excellent presentation. Thank you. Um, I have a question before I go to my colleagues and it's unfair at this point in time, but um, it's important to me and I think other members of council uh, when you come back to us later with further information, I'd like to know where we stand in the county. Are we still going to have the lowest tax rate? Something that um, I think some members uh, that ran in the election had promised. And um, I'll be interested to hear that, recognizing that the rest of um, the townships aren't through their process yet either. Uh, yes, thank you, Mayor Sennis. Uh, we, yep, definitely. Uh, uh, Erica, specifically in our department, tracks that information. We have a timeline that we have to implement uh, and ensure that our tax rates, once they're approved, are uh, are uploaded onto a certain site, and then the county is involved as well. So we'll definitely provide that report. It's, uh, I, I have cautioned council in the past that the rate is one side of the equation, uh, assessments the other side, right? So if we happen to some year have an assessment growth in another municipality that may be greater than ours, then that could affect that tax rate. But uh, definitely we will report out on that as soon as all the other municipalities have the rates approved and as soon as we get our consolidated rate bylaw approved. Okay, thank you. And now we'll go to Councillor Boyko. Uh, thank you. Through you, Mayor Sennis, uh, I'd like to uh, refer to Department 25. It's page 51 of the summary, and it talks about transit. And and I, I, I ask this knowing that from an environmental point of view, having transit in a community is a, a, a responsible thing to do. But we also have a fiduciary responsibility. So, so I'm balancing those two considerations. I, I know, I, I, at least I think I know, I think I understand that the government is giving us grants that have been extended until 2025. Uh, and that what is being proposed here is, is um, that we begin to create a bit of a reserve just in case that, that, that grant disappears after 2025. And I'm, I'm got a couple of questions about that. Um, I've seen 1%. So what is the amount of money that um, is being considered to be putting into this reserve? And I have another question um, coming back. Councillor Boyko, we are going to be receiving a report from our clerk, uh, Angie Chittick, on this. And I think maybe your question is a bit premature. I think we need to hear her report. Um, and then we can, we will definitely be receiving an answer to your question. Okay, you will, will that report come in before we approve this budget? Um, it, it definitely can, but I think that uh, it would be in addition to what Lane is uh, presenting right now. 
Yes, I, I could weigh in on that, uh, Madam Mayor, if you'd like. Um, sure. Yeah, definitely the, the budget that's presented here does not include um, Angie's report, which is provided later. Um, so what's outlined in Department 25 is the operation for this year um, and what we would um, set aside. Um, if if council is supportive of the, the uh, transit levy in, in one way or another, then we would amend that when we bring our first budget amendment back uh, when we're talking about reserve transfers. And we would uh, suggest that the transit levy would be a special levy. So it would be very clear and transparent on our tax billing process. So um, it's the concept of a transit levy. It wouldn't be included specifically in the municipal budget uh, levy, but as a special levy that would show up on the tax bill. And that's why it's being treated the way that it is. Yeah, so if you wouldn't mind waiting, Councillor Boyko, uh, the recommendation, as Lane said, doesn't include that. Very good. We'll proceed with that recommendation. All right. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Coolis. Um, through you. I'm just curious if you can provide the numbers of the total municipal tax increases from 2021 and 2020. I'm just wondering, like, even though it's going up 33.35 for me, for example, um, it was it similar in the previous years because that kind of provides a better long term picture for voters and uh, taxpayers. Uh, sure, I, I, I could uh, look up that information. I don't have it right at my fingertips, but I can say that this is uh, about a in terms of the net tax levy, it's about a percent or a percent and a half higher than typical. Um, we've always tried to aim for that figure of, of 3%. Um, there was a time that we were at like 2.9, but I think over the last couple of years, we went up over three. So we've been in that mid threes, but I can definitely get the exact number and circulate that to council. Thank you. And Deputy Mayor Black. Thank you, through Mayor Sennis. Uh, so I just want to be clear on the link again. So the 1% that's proposed in your recommendation is not included currently in the 3.35 for uh, rural and 2.66, so it would be an addition to that number? Is that what I'm understanding? That, that's correct, yeah. Okay, thank you. Councillor Henry. Thank you, through you, Mayor Sattis. Um I'm just curious with the development uh, with the Water Street project, is there a way that we can monetize the boat launch through the marina somehow? Um, a user pay system and maybe um, our our dump or uh, landfill pass could act as a marina pass for local residents, but those that come up and use that, is there a way that we can um, make some money off them? Uh, I, th I think the biggest challenge here would be the human resource involved with the policing that really. Um, it's definitely, we're seeing a, a launch which historically has been free and, and um, available to anybody, not just our repairs, but anybody that uses the Trent Servant Waterway. Um, yeah, I, I can see human resource challenges there that may actually outweigh uh, the revenues. And I'm, I'd have to really think that process through it. Um, it's, a, it's an idea that we can hash around the management team for sure. But... Thank you. Thank you. Right, I don't see any other questions here, Lane. So are you now looking uh, for a motion for your recommendation that was included in the slide deck? Uh, yes, to you, uh, Madam Mayor, that, that would be great. I can, uh, I can see if I can get that up on the screen here again, but it is included in the council package. Um, but here we go, I should be able to move that along. So that's the recommendation that's included in my report and uh, it would move the, uh, the it would essentially uh, approve the budget as is, uh, and then move it along to the next, which is formal adoption of the of the budget uh, as part of the PSAB process. And just as some background to, to council, we do it this way because uh, we need final numbers to be, provide the PSAB compliance report before we can bring it forward. Okay, and, and just for clarification again, the receiving and adoption of what has been presented is exactly as what was on the um, municipal proposed 2023 tax rate 
as it is. So in um, Smith and Ennismore, it would be 3.52%, which equates to $33.35 on a typical $314,173 home. And in Lakefield, it would be 2.66%, which equates to $32.50 on that same $314,173 home. Yes, you, Madam Mayor, that's correct. Yes, so Deputy Mayor Black. You're muted. Sorry, through you, Mayor Senate, I thought I'd taken it off. A um, couple of areas, again, that I think the recommendation to move forward as is, I, I think there needs to be some work done on waste management as far as uh, costs for the landfill site. Uh, I've already expressed my concerns around the ever-increasing deficit there. Um, so I'd like to see some numbers in that area uh, looked at as well as I'm not comfortable moving the uh, the one percent uh, for the link forward in uh, in the recommendation until we see the report. So again, I will reiterate the one percent. We haven't talked about that yet. All we're dealing with now is uh, a motion to support what Lane has given us. The link is a separate report we have not even looked at. So. When we support this, it won't be, the, the link is not part of that. Um, so we're not supporting the recommendation that's on the back of the uh, resolution? I'm is sorry? That, the link is in the re recommendation. In the recommendation that we have in front of us from Lane? No, it isn't. The report that came with the budget has the recommendation for the 1% of the link in it, I believe. If I'm reading the documents correctly. Have you looked at the recommendation that's on the screen? Deputy Mayor Black, have you looked at it? I'm seeing that, yeah, absolutely. Okay, the, the link that's is not, not in there. The link is not in there. So okay. all so we are- on paper. I'm sorry? So we're not looking at what the recommendation that was given to us on paper. We're looking at what's on the screen. We're only recommending the recommendation. Thumbnail. Yes, this recommendation is is uh, what the uh, our treasurer has brought forward, or the manager of financial services has brought forward, and we are going to be looking at the next um, the next report after we've approved this. It doesn't include it. Well, that's one of the recommendations in the report. So, if we're approving the recommendations at this point, I believe we're approving that. No. Maybe staff can, can clarify that for me. Sure, through you, Madam Mayor. Yeah, so um, the the budget document and the recommendation that's on the screen is what's included with uh, with my report. And then there is an additional report uh, provided by our, our clerk and manager of corporate services that talks about the link and the need to consider funding in the future. So that's that would come um, after the fact, council would debate that. And then if, uh, depending on what council determines, then we would uh, include that in any budget amendment coming forward. The, the key reason for doing this is that we want the municipal budget to move forward. And then we want discussion about any uh, transit levy to be a separate discussion that council has. Okay. okay. All right, Councillor Henry. Uh, thank you, through you. Um, I was just going to jump in and help try and clarify things, but I think we're there now. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. All right. So that that's why I wanted to uh, reiterate again that it had nothing to do with the, the report that will be coming forward. So if everyone is on the same page now, I'm looking for someone to move the oh and oh the other thing you mentioned uh deputy mayor black about uh the waste management i believe that um it's a report could come forward on that uh our uh, manager of financial services was mentioning that a report could come from staff and if we want to amend we could do that after the fact correct lane 
Uh, that's correct. We could amend the budget af after the fact. Um, it, based on the recommendation that's on, on the screen, we've moved forward uh, with respect to taxation and those things, but the budget could be amended for additional user fees that would come forward. Which will help for 2023. You okay, okay. with that? Yeah, thank you, Mayor Sennis. Thanks for the clarification. Okay, thank you. All right, so I'm looking for a mover for this recommendation. <laughs> Moved by Councillor Boyko, seconded by Second, um, I have a hand up for Deputy Mayor uh, Black. Are you seconding it? I can second it. Okay. All right. Uh, any discussion? Councillor Henry. Um, I think that, uh, or I want to request that any of our votes right here be recorded. Sure. You can Thank ask you. for a part of it. Yeah. All right, so uh, we've got a recorded vote request. Can we have the clerk please handle that? Uh, yeah, just give me one sec here. Sorry, should have been more prepared. <laughs> <laughs> okay, sorry. Uh, Deputy Mayor uh, Ron Black? Yes. Councillor Boyko? Yes. Councillor Coolis? Yes, sorry. It's okay. <laughs> Councillor Henry? Yes. Mayor Sennis? Yes. Motion has been passed. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, now uh, we'll move on to the next report that's in our agenda. Angela Chittick uh, with this um, special levy. Uh, uh, thank you very much. Sorry about the confusion with uh, with the reporting. Yes, yeah, just to be very clear, what we're talking about is a completely separate uh, proposal for a transit levy. Um, certainly council members will be familiar with our uh, link bus service. It is currently being operated, um, as you all know, uh, as a pilot, uh, thanks to funding that we received from the province of Ontario through the MTO uh, community transportation pilot. Uh, the report um, has some uh, information in it that uh, Lily, our sustainability coordinator has included. Uh, so I thank her for that. So there's some good uh, statistics about uh, the routes and about ridership statistics, but I, I won't focus on, on that so much. Uh, we're just trying to um, make a case here for the, the transit levy. Um, I can tell you that having worked here for the number of years that I have, um, you're, I'm not pictured here, but my, my hair is very gray, so I have been around for a while. Uh, we, we've certainly heard uh, that uh, community transportation is something that's come up over and over again uh, over the years through, through community engagement. Uh, certainly, um, Council will know there are a number of reasons uh, for that. Uh, not every resident obviously has the luxury of owning a car. Uh, we're finding too with, uh, with housing challenges that uh, people are selecting rural areas because it, it can be a little bit more affordable uh, to live in a rural area. However, then you do need transportation then once you get out to a rural area. Uh, employers uh, do tell us that they have they're more particularly recently that they're finding it, it hard to um, find employees. So uh, we can we can attract employees from outside of the region uh, to help our employers. And we know that when uh, some of you will, will remember there was what we called the old workers bus in Lakefield. It was a school bus. And it did provide um, a level of, of community transportation. When it was cancelled, uh, there were there were people who actually had to, you know, leave a, a job in in the area because they simply couldn't get transportation uh, to and from Peterborough. Uh, climate change is is certainly a, a, a rising concern, and we know uh, that if we can reduce the number of passenger vehicles on the road. It does uh, through, by offering community uh, transportation, there is a benefit for that. 
So I don't I don't think anybody will argue that that community transportation is important to our community. Uh, the biggest barrier to providing uh, rural transportation has obviously been funding, and and it was it it was like our prayers were answered when the MTO announced the the grant and, and we were successful with it. I know that Sherry will tell you uh, with her colleagues on county council, they're very, other communities are pretty envious of the fact that we we do have this service and, and we often get asked, uh, how, how can we join in as a way to participate? So uh, we do know uh, trans, transit services require uh, resources and, and providing 100% cost recovery through fares is just is just really not a reality. So we do want to uh, come to council at this point to make sure that we're having the conversation now that we're looking to start to build some taxation uh, support into the base budget. Um, I certainly don't want to come before you at the end of the pilot in 2025 <laughs> and have a conversation with you at that time um, that, that's going to put uh, uh, an increase perhaps for a, a huge tax uh, levy increase just related to transit in one year. Um, certainly, uh, you know, the other option would be to cancel the service altogether. And I, I'm not sure that that's going to be very palatable either. So uh, really we wanted to get this on your radar earlier rather than at the, at the end of the pilot period. So that's why we're coming to council at this point uh, to bring forward this uh, this idea of creating a separate uh, transit levy. Um, we just just in terms of a little bit more context around the pilot, we have a few things. Uh, you know, we've worked hard to try to build some uh, relationships with users. Uh, we've got Trent and Fleming student associations that are uh, partners now with the service, so they're they're actively using the service. Uh, we have increased our ridership. Um, starting a transit service isn't easy. Um, people in rural areas, quite frankly, aren't used to um, transit. They might even be a little bit reluctant to use a transit service. So we've worked hard to, to really establish a route that's based, um, uh, that uses our, our, our Hamlet areas as a, as a real base to get people uh, to use the service. This was the time to do it during a pilot when we had the funding to do it. It's going to give us really good data in terms of the um, of users and ridership. Uh, we actually have um, uh, Lily. Uh, she's going to be, pardon me, riding the bus um, over the next couple of weeks. We have good ridership data, but we really don't have great data on um, the, the actual stop locations. So we really want to get a better understanding of where people are getting on and off the bus. We have a notional idea of it, but we really want to get a better understanding of that. Uh, we do plan as well in 2024 to do a full service delivery review of the service so we can look at things like, like the routes. Maybe some of the routes will look different. Uh, they might. Uh, we'd like to look at options for on-demand. Uh, we could look at our fare structures. Uh, there's also gas tax revenue that's available um, uh, for established uh, transit services. So uh, essentially, when the pilot is over, we're, we're trying to be in a position where we can operate the most efficient pilot possible um, and, and uh, maximize our revenues. But having said all that, we're, we're really not expecting that this would be a, um, a break-even uh, operation. Uh, we have uh, current partners, Curve Lake and, and Community Care. They have clients and residents that are using the service, and they're doing their their best to get uh, contribute to the ridership. We would expect um, once the pilot is over, uh, we'd want Curve Lake to come to the table as a financial partner because uh, they do have several of the residents that uh, that do use the service. Uh, we're um, exploring opportunities with Peterborough Transit to use a smaller bus. That was something we really wanted to do at the outset, uh, but um, we started this pilot in at the very start of COVID, <laughs> which didn't help our ridership numbers either. So we opted for a larger bus so that we could spread people out. And um, uh, supply chain issues have, have created a bit of an issue for Peterborough Transit. They'd like to move to some smaller buses for, for the service as well, but we haven't had, uh, they're, they're, they're having some challenges in even securing those types of, uh, of vehicles. So all that to say, 
Uh, we are um, suggesting that we would look at a, uh, a separate transit tax levy. It would be similar to the ORCA levy. It would be very transparent on the tax bill that it, that it is a separate um, uh, amount that's being collected. Uh, the proposal is to um, look at a 1% equivalent um, kind of tax increase. This would start to build into our base budget um, taxation support. So based on 2022, we would estimate that that could uh, bring in revenue of between 82 to $83,000 in, in taxation support. We would propose that that money would be set aside in a uh, special transit reserve. So it wouldn't actually be used uh, immediately to, um, to uh, uh, operate the, the, the service. It would be set up as a reserve. And even if at some point in the future, uh, council made a different decision about transportation services and that reserve wouldn't be used for this type of um, support, it, it could certainly would, would be council's decision that could be used in, in another uh, service area. So we know that uh, establishing a new uh, a new tax is not something that that councils really want to consider, but we we are um, wanting to make sure that we're bringing this forward at, to you at this time uh, to build in the, the taxation support into the budget. Again, not wanting to do that at the at the eleventh hour when uh, when decisions are are going to be this that much more difficult to to have to think about all the different impacts. Uh, a couple of other things. Uh, so, uh, council can certainly. I, I know there'll be a lot of questions on, on establishing the ta uh, transit levy. We would also uh, suggest as well that we would do a little bit of lobbying to the MTO um, in an effort to uh, possibly extend the the uh, pilot. Uh, look at a grant extension. Uh, we could do this in a couple of ways. If we have some members attending the August AMO count, um, conference, pardon me, uh, we could have members um, uh, requ request a delegation, or we could actually try to um, get a meeting with the Minister of Transportation uh, directly. Uh, we would also suggest that um, we would use uh, our MPP to help lobby efforts to uh, extend uh, the pilot so that we can maximize uh, the grant. So. Um, those would be, I think those would be two things we'd want to do regardless of, uh, of how you'd want to move forward with the, with the transit levy. So I, I apologize, it took a little bit of time to explain that, but um, just wanted to give the rationale for bringing this forward to council and happy to take any questions. Before I turn to my colleagues, I have a question. Um, the, is it true that the grant money will exceed the end of the uh, pilot. Oh, yes. Yeah, sorry. Thank you. I, I, I did. I, I must have missed that in my notes. So, yeah, um, as we have worked hard to uh, build in increased ridership, uh, increased fares, and we've got the student associations on board, uh, th this particular grant is a little bit different. They actually will claw that back. So there's the potential that as we do better <laughs> and bring in more revenues, then that kind of works against us with the grant. And and we could have um, excess funds at, at the end of the pilot. So we wanna be in a position and the province, quite frankly, uh, they like us to spend all the money they give us. So uh, we, we, wanna, we wanna maximize every dollar we can. And I, I know the province will want us to do that as well, but that will, that will mean uh, possibly, you know, needing to extend it or looking at other ways that we can um, maximize uh, the expenses, uh, which we, we are trying to do. But as I said, uh, every time you bring in a little bit of uh, revenue, which we want to do, we, we need to do that. Uh, it kind of works uh, to not in our favor. <laughs> OK, and if uh, we were to ask for an extension, um, it, there's a possibility that the province could. The last time we did that, they gave us additional funding, correct? Yes, that's right. Yeah. So there's a possibility that that could happen again. There, that that could happen again. Of course, we're not the only community that benefited from this um, MTO grant. There are lots of other rural communities, and they're all going to be in the same boat. We meet um, a few times a year uh, as a as a group to talk about um, kind of challenges from our service and, and ways we can share information and and best practices. Uh, so. I, we won't be the only municipality that's, uh, that will want to see some 
type of continuation of, the, of this program. Okay, so um, I would like to suggest to my colleagues that we, um, in the recommendation that we have before us, um, that we separate uh, some of the recommendations so that um, the, the paragraph that says the Minister of Transportation be asked to extend the Township of Selwyn Transportation Pilot beyond March of 2025 and to lobby Dave Smith and that we consider requesting a delegation with the MTO at the August demo conference um, be separated from the last paragraph. So we're dealing with two separate things at this point in time. Um, I don't know if uh, the rest of my colleagues are interested in doing that, but I believe we should be attempting to extend the pilot um, and to lobby to do that. Um, and then we can talk about uh, any special levy separately and would be voted on separately. So do I have um, support to do that? Councillor Henry, you're muted. Thank you, Mayor Sattis. Um, yes, I will definitely back that. All right, so uh, you would move that we deal with the uh, two paragraphs that are talking about lobbying and extending. You would move that? Yes, I will move that. Thank you. Deputy Mayor Black. I will second that. Okay, thank you. Um, now, before we vote on it, I am suggesting that we could request a delegation with the MTO at AMO, but we don't always get the delegations we request. We did have one for the Roma with um, the Ministry of Housing on Bill 23 that was denied. And so I would hate to put all our eggs in the basket that we um, ask for a delegation and then may not receive it. So I would like to uh, also um, <clears throat> suggest that we have a, a request with the uh, Minister of the Ministry of Transportation to meet with her in her office in Queen's Park, if possible, um, or where they would allow us to do that. Are you okay with that, the mover and the seconder? Yes. Yes. Okay, so... Angie, have you got the change that I've, or the amendment that I've uh, asked for for the first, the yes. second and the third paragraph? It, yes, yes, I, we, we, we have captured that. Okay. And, and it just, just one other thing, and I, I sorry, just to add one other item. Yeah. I, in terms of, I, I just wanted to clarify as well, just to give a context of the, the actual dollar value. So um, if council were to move forward, with the 1% one percent, uh, 1 uh, tax uh, levy increase uh, for transit, it would equate in a dollar amount to about between seven and $8 uh, per household. So the, the numbers that council reviewed uh, in the previous uh, slide uh, presentation from Lane, um, you would take that, that dollar amount um, that's proposed in, in the Smith and Ennismore award, which I think was around, I forget whether it was 33 or 32, but, um, that plus say seven or eight dollars and the same for the Lakefield Ward, just so that you have uh, a bit of context in terms of the actual uh, dollar impact for um, the typical household. Okay, um, we're not dealing with that right now. Uh, what's on the table is the uh, two paragraphs that are looking to lobby to extend. So we have a mover and seconder on that. We are not dealing with special levy yet. That's another um, thing for debate. So I'll call the question. All those in favor? That is carried. Sorry, that is carried. All right. So now we're looking at um, considering endorsing the implementation of a 1% special transit levy in 2023, 24, and 25. And I will open this up to um, council for debate. 
Councillor Boyko. Um, thank you very much. Um, and Angie, I, I, I'm sure that Lane will join me in saying there's nothing wrong with gray hair. Um, <laughs> the, uh, yeah. what, what I'm looking at is, is that we just spent a lot of time in talking about uh, the worries that we have about deficits in fire, the worries that we have about deficits in the two arenas and how we can possibly deal with those things. And what we are talking about now is adopting another program that, um, and thank you for being direct, um, will be in deficit every year. And, and while I am fully in support of doing all we can to get cars off the road and mitigate climate change and all the other things that you're talking about, that's we what we need to balance all of that good stuff with our fiduciary responsibilities. I looked at the operating sales revenues and fees um, this year, and I, and I know it's early, and I know we're coming out of the pandemic of about eighty-seven thousand dollars. So, say ridership doubled, or say say ridership tripled, and and we brought in two hundred and sixty-one thousand. Well, if the cost of the thing is is over half a million dollars, we're still saying that we need over two hundred seventy thousand dollars a year. To, to, to run the transit. Now those numbers will change as we're going forward. But if we use the numbers that we've got now, and I know that Selwyn is only one of the partners that is contributing to this, but I am wondering whether we are talking about taking something on, losing money every year is worth it. So that's not a question that I, I want you to answer necessarily, Angie, but it's a question I would like on the floor and perhaps other councillors can uh, can respond if they wish. Thank you. I think, uh, Angie, did you want to respond to that or? No, I, I think that's a debate uh, certainly for council to have. Absolutely, yeah. Thank you. All right, Councillor Coolis. Um, I just want to clarify too here that like, this 1% um, is added on to that 4.86. So that's bringing it up to 5.86. And then that doesn't, no, how does, I'm just, I wanna clarify how ORCA and the OPP also come in here, because I just wanna make okay. sure. So what we're, what we're looking at is the numbers that we have approved. So if you look, for example, at Smith and Ennismore, um, it was $33.35. And yep. Angie is saying that that would increase, the 1% levy would increase by seven or $8 on top of that. Right, so I think what I'm asking then is ORCA and OPP already included in that or are we, okay, so there's gonna be more added as we no, go. No, 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 no. The, the, the bottom line is right now for Smith & Ennis more $33.35 tax increase annually for those wards. Okay. There's no other addition. What we're looking at with this um, recommendation is to add possibly another seven or $8. If we go with 1%, we could possibly go with a lesser uh, percentage. Okay, My, I did have a second question, like as a follow-up to that was, is there a tiered approach that we've thought of if we do get the extension past 2025? Like, uh, and that would like, would it bring it down to like 0.5% each year? Uh, sorry, uh, just to follow up on that, Mary. So not uh, with, with no um, guarantee that it would extend, we didn't really look at that as a scenario. So essentially what we have tried to do is look at, and, and John kind of gave the number, uh, what would need to be built into the base budget of about quarter of a million to um, subsidize the, the, the transportation. So having, um, having kind of that number, we would look at, um, you know, that 1% um, tax levy would get us to that quarter million at, at year three to kind of build that taxation support into the base budget. Anything um, like if we were to get the grant, um, if we had any idea in the, in the intervening years that, um, that uh, we would be successful, we could maybe look at the, the tax levy in a different way. Maybe it would be less. Yeah. Okay. Um, and I might have missed that because I did get kicked off. So. Yeah, oh, thanks. okay. No, no problem. <laughs> Deputy Mayor Black. Thank you, through Mayor Senes. Excellent report, uh, Angie, on this. And, uh, you know, 
as uh, Councillor Boyko said, there's 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 no um, suggestion that it's not an important service and that we're not concerned with climate change. But um, Councillor Boyko did the math quite well. Uh, it's an additional, even with um, uh, it's an additional one percent on our budget, which is twenty five percent increase on the on what's proposed at this point. I know everybody wants to talk about it in dollars at seven and eight dollars, but it's uh, it's adding a full percentage uh, point to the Smith Innismore one, which would take it to uh, 4.52, and the uh, Lakeville one to 3.66 uh, is the way I read it. Um, the cost to run the service is $500,000 a year approximately. Uh, as uh, Councillor Boyko said, even if we get ridership to a level, uh, it's still a $250,000 uh, add-on uh, deficit program, which is so three percent each year forever, uh, added to uh, what we're already going to add on, which would probably be another inflationary increase each year. So that's really bringing future um, budgets to about six percent on average um, if we take this service on. I believe we should do everything politically we can to uh, to go after those grants and those sorts of things, but. Uh, the three years at 1% will only give us cover the deficit for one more year. And then what do we do? Now we're at half a million dollars the next year to deal with. Oh, so I think, we're, I think we're setting ourselves up for, for, for some failure uh, down the road as well uh, by um, going at this maybe a little earlier than we need to. And I'm also concerned about, you know, it's not only our increase, our budget increase to the average taxpayer. It's everything else they're paying for, you know. Inflation is still at six and seven percent, um, you know. And I and I as as I do support public transit, hundred percent. I started in politics over environmental issues, and this is definitely uh, fits in that category in that lane for me. But uh, I'm just not sure it's the right year to start um, this. I'd like to see more statistics and and more information on um, the growth of it and how it can be used. And what other partners are. Um, I do believe the municipality needs to have skin in the game uh, if we truly support public transit. Just not sure this is the right year and the right amount. Maybe a smaller amount uh, or pushing it to, to next year uh, is, uh, is kind of where I'm at with it right now. Uh, Angie. Yeah, sorry. I, I just wanted to clarify the 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 uh, comment, uh, Ron, uh, in case you misunderstood, that we're not proposing that this would be a one percent tax levy levy in perpetuity. This this tax levy would be for the next three years because it would build in to our base budget a base amount. So it would be it would be built. It, it's it'd be baked in the cake already at that point. So it doesn't it, it that. Um, that one percent wouldn't increase; it wouldn't be needed uh, year after year after year after year. No, but if it's sorry, a three year mayor sentence. If it's baked into the base budget, it's there every year. It's three percent over our lifetime because it's a new base item in the budget. So I, I, I'm not understanding the math. If that's if you're saying it goes away, if the taxes are going to reduce by uh, that amount after year three, I don't believe that's what you're saying. What what I mean, it just it becomes part of the base budget. So just like you've just considered, um, you know, the the increase to this year's overall budget, those uh, expenses and uh, the the increase in taxation level continues on from year to year. Yeah, we're working from a larger base moving forward, which is still taxes. And whether you separate it out as a separate charge of one percent, uh, and so it doesn't look as though it affects tax rate, it does. I mean, at the end of the day, you're raising the base of our taxes to everybody uh, by that amount. So um, you can carve it up however you like, but at the end of the day, that's gonna be an increase in cost for every resident uh, forever. Uh, fair enough. I just wanted to be clear that it wasn't, um, you know, a, an additional tax levy increase. Yeah, sorry. Councillor Boyko. Yes, thank you. Um, yeah, if if we put this levy on, we we'd have two hundred forty six thousand in in reserves that we could then use to offset the cost of of carrying the the service forward. 
uh, if the uh, if the ministry stopped the grant or if the ministry reduced the grant, uh, I can't see them continuing at this level. Um, I would not be willing to support this. I'll put my cards on the table for the reasons that I've said already, um, because I believe that I won't read every number of things that I said already, but if we are looking at spending the taxpayers' monies responsibly, and I know we're all we're all in 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 that game and in agreement, I don't believe that subsidizing the users of this service is a good use of all taxpayers' money for this service that so very few are taking advantage of. It's the same conversation we had with respect to the arena. It's the same conversation we had with respect to waste management and tipping fees. And it's got to be the same conversation we're having now. It's got to be a user pay. And we are setting up this system now that it will never be a user pay. And therefore, I, I don't support it. Uh, Councillor Henry. Thank you. Through you, Mayor Sanos. Um, are there other opportunities for us here to work with possibly ride sharing programs? Um, other municipalities are using those. Just uh, looking at the user base, um, the one percent that that's a that's a pretty large uh, jump to our budget. Um, are we looking at other opportunities? I, I can try to answer that. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so through uh, the service delivery review that we plan to do in 2024, yeah, we we want to look at some uh, other options. Um, on demand, I think I had mentioned, uh, which uh, ride shares and other, um, some other communities are kind of using a combination of traditional transit with uh, along with ride shares. So that that that's an option as well. And also, is it possible for us to get, sorry, um, just follow it up through you, Mayor Sinus. Is it possible to get possibly the numbers that um, community cares, they're a part of this, they also offer private shuttle service um, for their clientele. Um, is that something that we can see the numbers that we can, if these people can be using the bus instead of the community care service or the other services operating through Lynn and the Victoria Order of Nurses for uh, transporting people. We've got a few of these operating. Is there a way we can get numbers from them and maybe consolidate that somehow? Yeah, for sure. Cur Curve Lake, it, or sorry, um, Community Care is one of our partners. Uh, we'd identified them early on and we can get some statistics from them. The way we try to work our service in concert with them, they have a number of clients who can manage a on a conventional transit system, but they they might have a client out um, somewhere in Young's Point who where our where the link doesn't travel to. So they might be able to have their volunteer pick up that client and then take them into Lakefield so that they can get onto the conventional bus and then get into uh, Peterborough. It frees up their resources so that they can actually uh, provide door to door service for clients that really can't use the traditional service. So that's the way we've been trying to work with community care. So they're trying to really promote our service to help their service. And in response again through you, Mayor Sanis, um, by collecting, but if this went through, is this uh, possibly to be used as a potential leverage uh, showing the province and the uh, funding organizations that we have reserves in it and that they should continue to support us beyond this time? Uh, yeah, I think that um, that would show uh, the province that we've got some skin in the game for sure. And we're, we're starting to build in uh, some sustainability and capacity into the system. Okay. Um, thank you. I don't see any other hands up. Um, I know that the city is doing a review of their transit. Not sure what the outcome is going to be with that and if it would affect negatively or positively with what we're doing right now. Um, so I'm suggesting possibly that uh, we might be a, a little uh, premature in 
starting or thinking about uh, putting a levy aside for this. Um, I also, um, I have been questioned many times about the empty bus that drives around. A lot of people see it and are saying, what are we doing? Um, and, you know, how are we helping with greenhouse gases, having this big bus driving around and nobody in it? Um, however, I have a car. We all drive cars. We don't need to rely on public transit. And there is a, a certain segment of our population that does. And I think that uh, we have to be thinking about them. No, the ridership isn't really high right now, but it will increase. We know that our population is going to increase. And uh, I, there are employers, as Angie said, that are appreciative of having the ability to have their employees take the bus to get to work because they don't have a car and there is a skilled labor shortage right now. And some of those people are, are counting on the bus. So um, my suggestion would be that um, maybe if we proceed to try and get um, an extension for another year with this, that we can look at the assessment that's going to be done next year and that we um, re-look at this again. Uh, my only other suggestion would be instead of a 1% levy, that we look at a 0.5% levy that would be put aside. And if we don't continue on with that, the money could be used elsewhere, but it would show both the province and our partners that we are uh, indeed, we do have some skin in the game. So that's uh, uh, that's my um, uh, contribution to the conversation. And I don't know if anybody else is, I've heard a couple of people say they're not interested at all, but um, I'd like to hear what anyone has to say about that. Deputy Mayor Black. Thank you, Mayor Sanders, and I, I certainly echo a lot of your your points around the need, and um, that you know, cross our fingers, ridership goes up, and maybe we can get a a bus that hasn't got as large an impact on the environment as this big bus does. Um, but I would prefer to wait till we have our meeting with the minister to see what their take on future grant possibilities are before uh, we stick our toe in the water on this one. Um, hopefully we can get that meeting uh, in, the, in the next uh, five or six months and reconsider this uh, for next year at this point. I'm just concerned about, you know, again, our, our, our increase is at 3.52 for the larger rural component. That takes it over 4%. Um, and I was hoping to stay within that 3%. I, I think the staff have done an excellent job on majority of this budget other than maybe waste management I have some concerns around but adding another basically 25 percent to that number for this one item at this point um, I just don't think it's it's the right time for it given all the other costs that people have these days uh, I would like to talk to the minister get some uh, sense from them as to the future of these programs hopefully uh, they believe in them as much as we do and they can give us some assurances that if we start creating a reserve uh, to help cover some of the deficit moving forward, um, then I'm more than willing to reconsider it at that point. But without any kind of sense from the ministry that this will this program will go on, I don't think this municipality can afford a half a million dollars a year to operate the bus. Um, uh, you know, based on on what we see today, what information I have today on it. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Boyko. Thank you. I won't reiterate all that I've said before, but I want to say that I agree with uh, with Deputy uh, Mayor Black. And besides waiting from the response for the ministry, Lily would be able to bring us more data back 
if we waited and we saw, does ridership actually go up? Um, can we change to a smaller bus? Can we change the, the stops and the routes um, to try to increase ridership? Um, there's a lot of information that we don't have. So therefore I add um, again, that's why I won't be supporting the notion of a one or even a half percent um, levy. Okay, thank you. Um, there was no actual motion on the floor uh, for the special levy. It was a recommendation that was brought forward. Um, Angie, is there any other information that you would like back from council on this? Uh, no, um, I think uh, we've heard the comments and we'll, uh, we'll collect some more information and hopefully we can get a, a meeting with the minister and get a sense of um, the future of the grant and we'll move forward from there. Okay, thank you. We'll also have a better idea of uh, where the city is going with their transit as well, which is going to be an important component of the whole thing. Thank you very much. Um, all right, we have no consent items. Uh, we uh, will move down to the bylaw, the confirming bylaw 2023-010. I'm looking for a mover. Councillor Boyko, seconded by uh, Deputy Mayor Black. All in favor? It's carried, thank you. And a motion to adjourn, please. Councillor Henry, seconded by Councillor Coolis. All in favor? That is carried, thank you. Thank you, thanks staff. And council. Thanks, everyone. Great meeting. Yeah.